And now, holy shit, folks. I always remind people, you know I am suspended for life for minor <laughs> hockey. <laughs> it's my duty to please the booty. Did you catch a rattlesnake and then drive home with it in your car holding it the whole time? <laughs> yep. Phil only drinks Coke. He doesn't drink water. I fuck quit. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Spit and Chicklets. Hello. Everybody, welcome to episode 412 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What's up, everyone? I'm back in the big chair this week. It killed me to not get to Pittsburgh, but you got to take care of your health. The season is in full swing, and the boys are horny to talk about it, so let's go around the table, see who's up. Me Mike so Rally, horny. Producer, producer, what's me up, so buddy? horny for some Mommy hockey. Fluffy pillow. Uh, ah. hey, wait, hey, what can I get for $10? All right, I got. I mean, I think we should just talk about RA's back for the first twenty minutes. Like, what's let's going talk on? about missing RA. You know, we we missed the guy in Pittsburgh, yeah. and he says he's doing a lot better, which is great. And he must be seeing one of the most world renowned doctors <laughs> because the guy told him, "Don't get PT, just go home and wait it out." That's big time doctoring in my eyes, right there, Biz. No, when, uh, I mean RA. When you told me that, my fucking jaw dropped to the floor. That's why we had to start late. I, I hey, you think actually, I should maybe get I massage or um, some stem or, or you know, uh, no, just sit on the couch, dude. You'll be good. RA, I had fucking two appointments a day for a week, and and I and I feel great. Everything's moving properly. Like probably the worst possible advice. Like who who the fuck? No, is Biz. Your, no, Biz. Sorry. Who's Biz, your I mean, doctor? The guy who's making those sandwiches, the Dr. breakfast Cindy sandwiches. You're my doctor. <laughs> Give me boom bots. Biz, oh, who's when, your on my who biz, on my seventeenth ankle surgery. The guy said actually just just go wait it out post surgery. I didn't do anything, and it got it it got better right away. Honestly though, even if she had physical ther- therapy for me, I could barely leave the house. It was like agony just to walk to the bathroom, let alone doing a number two. It was brutal, dude. I I left the house once in like two weeks to go to the doctors and then to get my hair cut the other day. Like, have you walk. talked to them about like potential psoas work? Do you know what your psoas is? I have no friggin' clue, Paul. So it's like an area in your abdomen that like, a lot of the shit's connected to it. It helps release your lower back big time. Really all in that area. I'm like, uh, they get you right but, here oh. and you're like, whoa, why are they pushing my stomach? Ah, And then all of a sudden your lower back feels better. It's crazy. All right. You got to look through your DMs. I know you've been having a lot of doctors reach out to you. Well, why, why did you raise your eyebrows like that? No, oh, I, I didn't even quite. DMs even are probably did, filled with yeah. filthy porn and <laughs> I, drug paraphernalia talk. I never realized you got, how many you got to siphon follow us. through the bullshit, okay? Because you told me that you didn't realize how many Chicklets doctors follow us, right? Yeah, tons you of could them. have a full F one fucking race team, you know, fixing your body. Like you could be a, a specimen in no time. Find the right doctor, and I think that you should get some like ART work done to get things moving around properly. Take advantage. Maybe you got a dry needler in there. You It'll be- just enhance the time of the until you're back. Yeah, you know, well, full speed RA. Well, it's more the the nerve. It's sciat is it sciatica or sciatica, however you pronounce. It. I don't know if the C sciatica. That's what it is. So it's like the back, and then it, it, the pain goes to your ass, then down your leg. It's just it's like an aliens in there moving around or something. But- Correct, and and like there's something that's causing that nerve to pinch, right? And it's more than likely muscle related. Like, what about inversion table? Have they told you to jump on an inversion table? No, that, no, no. <laughs> You'll I, feel I'll the same sleep. as when you hit your gravity bong and walk around the house. It's the same yeah. thing. I- <laughs> <laughs> Those flex rules, boy, they put you in a loop zone when you wake up in the morning. We got to like we got to get like R.A. R.A. goes to physio behind the that scenes. That could be going. a YouTube series. Oh. <laughs> but it, but I will say I w- it was overwhelming how many people reached out, just our regular listeners, fans, like uh, people in the sport media, like, all right, you all right. I was getting texts from people I wasn't expecting. Like Jeff Merrick texted me. But I think that video I put out of my picks, I was looking bad there. But uh, what, the reason I was shaking so bad in the video, because I was trying to flamingo because I couldn't put weight on both legs. So everything else was shaking. People were like, holy shit, dude, you got like Parkinson's. I was like, no, no, I was just flamingo. And it's not that. Well, the, 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 that, that video, I'm glad you brought that up because you weren't um, on the show last week. Why didn't you just sit down for that video? <laughs> I don't um, get it. I was trying to be a hot, I guess. Oh, you. Oh, so you kind of yeah. just wanted maybe a couple just, of those. I thought, like, you were, I thought you were starting a new gambling character <laughs> for the content. Yeah, for the content, I guess. <laughs> this is the guy who went to Vegas for the yeah. bankroll. Well, He's now yeah. smoking crack with this no money. My sciatic special pick. The guy who hit his winnings in his, in his underwear coming back from it's the really going to hurt the book. My sciatic right pick the of the week. Vancouver money line. And then oh, it was six. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, my oh, pick. Shit. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a lot better Bruce, today. Bruce, there but... it is. Ah, my back. <laughs> oh, 
speaking of Bruce, there it is. We should say this now. Uh, he didn't coach him when he was at Vancouver, but our guest today, Ryan Kessler, the Vancouver Canucks and the Anaheim Ducks. Get Unreal. A long later. Awesome interview. It's probably well over an hour. You're going to love it. But we'll hour get to and a half. Later. Wow. Was that, that was an hour and a half. Hour and a half, dude. He just like it was it, we were just snapping it around like he was in that fucking series. Pretty fair to say uh, Kess don't give a fuck. I would, no. I would, I would say of all of our guests, he would challenge for the lowest of give a fuck meters. Yes, he would, he would, he would be right up there on the Mount Rushmore. Maybe, thank you to the listeners. Fuck. Also, um, great feedback on the the Nate Dog interview. Um, funny enough, I mean, we now have Crosby and Nate Dog that are possibly going to be looking for money with the Sandbaggers, considering they both yeah. claim to have started it. Apparently, which I think correct, Crosby's still, dad won't stop talking about. It. They're rich enough. They're rich enough. I mean, Nate Dog, we went over his contract, but great feedback on the interview. One of the most uh, open, I would say, easy to interview superstars in the game, no doubt, because he really doesn't care in terms of uh, speaking his mind freely. And it was a blast to catch up with him. So that was, that was cool hearing the, the people enjoyed it. I am going to be hounding the airways for any of you Chicklets listeners. Anytime you see an interview with the McKinnon and he's dropping a cliche, send it to us. He is he is adamant that he is not a cliche guy, but it's difficult. And maybe he's just being uh, naive unless you think do it. Are you are you all in on him not being a cliche guy? It's impossible to not drop cliches occasionally. There's 82 games. He's talking to the media after pregame skates after the game. He will be dropping cliches here and there. But all that I care about as now I'm on the other side. Actually, we could talk about the article um, that clown Mark Spector wrote about McDavid. It was a pretty good article, though, about how he's way more open and willing to doing interviews now. It's pretty interesting. I read it today. But McKinnon, no matter what, you're going to always have to drop the cliches because there's just too much talking. But being on the other side, you just appreciate when they're giving an effort to not drop them all the time. Do you know what I'm saying? I like if you me, if you're interviewing a guy, and he's got nothing. You're like, Jesus yeah. Christ. I'll tell you what, though. I appreciate his apology to Aunt Marcia. Uh, yep. We're appreciative yep. of the season tickets. Yep. And, you know, maybe maybe even further, they can, you know, maybe we can get together for Thanksgiving or something. So we'll, we'll, we'll put it in the McKinnon's court. But it was good to get all that wrapped up. All right. What do you got going? Actually, we, we it interrupted uh, Grinelli during your intro. What the fuck do you got going, buddy? Absolutely nothing. I'm such a fucking loser. Uh, another we slow weekend in New York City, the most <laughs> Popping city in the world. I'm not doing anything. I don't even like going out anymore. So it's just you have a girlfriend. Here. You have a girlfriend. I know, but it's like, why do you live in New York City to go out? And I just sit well, on you... my couch all day. I, I did. Know, hey, like... I did buy my first piece of like legitimate art this weekend. Hundred percent got oh, yeah. swindled. NFT. Fake, One thousand or, already tanked. Already tanked. No, this one's not digital. Oh, this those stupid figure, plastic figurines that everybody buys. Those hype beasts. They sit in the corner of your room. What are those called? I don't even know. Wait, but I, this, what, what this did you piece, buy? show us this piece of art gotta, right now. No, it. so it gets here in two weeks. But what this piece is? So my girlfriend's big into art. She went to art school. So she was at this place where you can buy these really like nice French and Italian pieces of art. So I went in there and um, she's just walking around and I sit down at the computer. Sound like Ari's doctor to search. Like a bowl of rigatoni. And I just type in hockey and a chocolate croissant because it's French and Italian, he said. <laughs> and I type in hockey on this search database just to see if I can find a hockey poster. And this beautiful 1960 painting of uh, roller hockey when it was in the Olympics uh, came up. And it's gorgeous. Kind of cool. From kind the of sounds sick. of it, kind of cool because you're the Chicklets Cup guy. All right. Well, kind of I mean, sick. So I, I had I to buy see it. How big? Uh, it's about three and a half feet. It's huge. And it's what'd you spend? Like 400 bucks. And then I had to get it framed for another 175. So almost 600 bucks right now with taxes. So Jeez. it's a hey, it's still it's still less than the NFT I bought. So I was expecting a lot worse with. I think it was a, a great find by you, Grinnell. Okay. I mean, the fact that it's roller hockey and there's like some in Italian career, roller hockey. Yeah, you're I Italian. Was, I was hoping we could shit on you, but I can't really shit on you. So I, mean, I was speaking, expecting of, to speaking get shit of art, on. speaking of art, look what's behind business head. He can't say shit about <laughs> art. That's a go- Goyer. That looks like the ocean uh, and a mountain combined. 
Not like, like the mountains behind the ocean, more just like the oceans in the mountains. So I got the not a big deal thing here, but I haven't put two new holes in the wall because I rented this place and I got a reno going on. Actually, I've had uh, Pasha and River uh, start the documentation of it. I, I bought this old Benny Gonzalez design house and they're going to document it. But uh, but I'm renting uh, my buddy's uh, mom's place and it's a great little spot here near Old Town and I get to be close enough for the reno. But this is the artwork that I think should remain behind me while I'm here. No, I like it. Yeah, it's sweet. Yeah. I got one piece of artwork in my office. I don't know if I can turn this. How nice is this? Seventh hole. Oh, nice. That old sandwich golf club. One of the best courses in the world. But that's 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 the artwork. I never I knew what the rest of that room looked like. I'm glad you gave oh, us this the room is absolutely pigeon. I'm a pigeon. So if you want to ask what's going on with me, um, I caught the uh behind the scenes vlog we did of our trip to Pittsburgh. Of getting them it was out. great. It was great. The Malkut stuff, hilarious. Um, a lot of different things that we got to show in that video. It wasn't super long, but it was good. But uh, I think people out there will understand what I'm saying. When I look, when I look in the mirror, I see one thing. But then when I see myself on video, it's like I'm brainwashed to thinking I look a certain way. I got fat face now. I got moon face. But that's after four days of nonstop drinking. No, Your that face was is the swollen. first day of the trip. <laughs> I'm walking down the that sidewalk when I say basically me day. and Merle's have three Stanley Cups without winning one. But when I look in the mirror, I don't see that's how I look. But, you know, like you believe you look a certain way and you've mind Jedi mind. Trick. I got fat face. <laughs> fucking horrible i used to like pictures of myself not anymore it's been a while well that's why you always send us pictures of when you're like seven years old yeah. you love exactly. that yeah no so, one in the world sends pictures and post pictures of them as little kids more than ra which makes <laughs> sense all right i mean i thought i was ugly then i thought i was better looking then i might as well go back to the sixth grade pictures but i, I usually do them when like we're talking about a weird topic i happen to have a goofy picture like when someone said snakes the other day i, I found pictures of me with snakes wrapped around me from bush gardens when i was like 10 I, I'm just a freak biz out. Did you see that one, Biz? I had a big giant boa, boa around my neck. No, no, I have like a hard Brittany? time keeping up no. with you online there, buddy. I tell you what, you're you're on there quite a bit, and like somehow sometimes in the wee hours of the night, you were yeah. just mucking it up. No, the- actually, all right. The other day, you had a post or something like it's like five twenty a.m. Were you up till five a.m. Yeah. the other day? Well, I, yeah, you know what? It was I was dealing with the this stuff here, and it wasn't like pain but it was like i couldn't i couldn't sleep finally i took like a, an extra flex i didn't fall asleep till like seven o'clock in the morning so like i was up just doing doing work thinking i was gonna nod off from the flex roll but the, i had that was the one bad night of sleep i had but yeah but okay you know, that's I'm, good. A, I'm a night owl anyways i mean uh, uh, have i mentioned the flex roll story of when i went to broadway have i told you no. guys that no if she, oh, my I'm wife so got happy tickets. i don't even remember this. my wife got tickets to um <laughs> yeah, I remember what, the what's story. the what's the broadway show it's about like africa and stuff Oh, oh, um, the Mormon kind one? of like what is it? The Mormon one. Um, yeah, the B- B- Book, oh, Mormon, Book right? of Mormon. Book of Mormon. Yeah, I've seen it. So I'd never been to Broadway, and but my neck was mangled. I think it was from the train ride. Something happened, so I just took a muscle relaxer. I had muscle relaxers on me. I was pumped. Second row, Broadway, fired up. Never been to Broadway. Ten minutes into the show, dude, I was the most hated person. There was people flipping out behind me wake your husband up it's embarrassing the people the people in the play are looking oh, at me oh and i didn't know this my wife told oh, me we ended up leaving but i guess you know that's considered like <laughs> no good no is social it faux pas, oh, is it faux, yeah. My yeah. Faux pas to be snoozing second row at broadway <laughs> well, but those, thing flexor snooze- alls, those those flexor all things it's like getting a dart in your neck yeah. I, I i couldn't even keep my i was trying you know when you're trying so hard to stay awake but I'd had like a vodka soda. And it's just, but I remember, yes, my, my only like you snored that loud where minutes. you were that disruptive. I was snoring. Dude, I, so did you ever go back and see it or any other uh, Broadway plays? Biz? No, no. Those aren't cheap. Either. I think I'm paying tickets 700 a piece or something like that. I think That's it was like, like off Broadway map. at the time. I don't remember exactly. I just remember in a theater sleeping. And then we had our live show in Pittsburgh. I thought, Jesus Christ, if I could see the guy front row sleeping, I'd want to <laughs> kill myself. <laughs> I, you should go. Well, see hey, yeah, no, hey, not a chance. You'd be picking the guy apart, man. You were you were buzzing during that live show. You and Army oh, were working. So, I was so I was so together. I was so fired up, you know, there. That was great. Oh, that, that was great. Blast. We're going to we're going to try to do one in Boston, right? Or are we not even mentioning that yet? 
No, we no, should. We mention are. That. Yeah, we, we 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 can't mention where and when, but I mean, it, it will be in Boston for the Winter Classic. We're not going to say the day or when. All right, we can say that. That'll be exciting. I'm very excited to get our live show groove going. Maybe two or three a year. Um, also, I didn't know the the outdoor classic game this year. It's on January second. Yeah. So that's that's interesting. Maybe they didn't want to go against the Rose Bowl. Although actually, January first this year is a Sunday, so NFL, NFL. too. So it's it's yep. kind of going to be uh, interesting to see. And I guess. January 2nd will be the national holiday of New Year's Day. So uh, I don't know why I'm even talking about that. But what's going on with the NHL, R.A.? Well, I was uh, just going to bring up one yeah. quick thing we did oh, mention ahead, last Biz. week, and I was surprised we forgot to, was Sandbagger with uh, Bugsy and Army. <laughs> we have not released. Uh, we released the behind-the-scenes video. We didn't men- mention or show any of the Sandbagger. I think we're going to try to tease it, but it'll be coming out fairly soon. Pasha's working on that, so... Uh, thank you to the whole crew who came out and filmed that. And uh, and the eighth hole, you guys, the tee box, the eighth tee box, something yeah. went down First that I can't even show. describe. <laughs> don't, yeah. You don't even know what the hell I'm talking about either. You couldn't guess in a million years what happens on the eighth tee box at Swickley Heights Golf Club, a beautiful golf course outside of Pittsburgh, amazing place. But what happens on the eighth tee will shock will shock you forever. So look forward to that coming out. Maybe mid, late November. That's a little hopefully. ball tickle. We're going to tease yeah, them in three weeks. Maybe we'll we'll send out no a little flare in, in the next uh, couple of days uh, uh, on Twitter, social media. Follow us on there, and uh, you'll get a little bit of the in-depth look. You guys added Sunday. some new rules, too, though, to the sandbag, didn't you? One we thing we did. did do. We did. We'll wait. So, we'll wait. All, we'll wait for that. We're just going to tease you right now. Okay. We're just, we're just tickle, yeah. tickling the nutsack. Little blue balls. Just, so, just, just, you know, trying to rub that to the in a good spot. Talk. Biz, what you just recuperate all week? Last week, you guys had a long week, man. I just, it was a it was a long one. Then we went back to TNT. We're gonna get to that because we ended up watching a few fun teams. Uh, we saw Florida, which looking very thin on the back end. We had Kachuk on the new Mister TNT, self described. Uh, and then we had Philly as well. So I, we got to watch them closely. Had some fun with talk. I know you have it mentioned uh, later in the outline, but off the top here, congrats to Anson Carter. Him and uh, him and, a, and an owner, they ended up purchasing the Atlanta Gladiators of the ECHL. So they're going to bring that organization and, and grow the game in Atlanta uh, in a new direction. Uh, Derek Nesbitt, I think that he's still involved in the C- team to some capacity. So they're going to grow the youth program. So really cool to see uh, my counterpart there on, on TNT, uh, get ownership of an ECHL franchise. So big ups to him and, uh, but got home RA. And I was actually talking to Grinelli before we uh, got going here. I won't be too long winded, but yes, got some good hikes in, got the body. Nice moving, biz. Got the- when you're but, hiking biz, I we love it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. What, Tell what? me about it. Yes. No, when yeah. Biz is eating right and hiking <laughs> and feeling good, he is the balls. Yeah. So very came into this one, very fresh minded because sometimes I come on here and maybe my uh, hot takes or, or analogies aren't so great. And sometimes I might even sound close to as dumb as wit and his predictions, not quite there, but I am ready to go with the hockey talk. Hey, asshole. I can't if you want to go over predictions since fucking our fucking idiot, t- 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 you and I Vancouver Canucks, they're horrible. Had them in the you top, said the Buffalo the Pacific- Sabres were looking for the first overall pick, bro. If you want to go back to takes on this show, since we there's nobody in this has survived. My takes crushed your takes. Take quick. At this point, right now, if if Sabres won the cup, I'd probably be getting a float on the fucking parade for what I've done to revive their organization since I started barking at them. Look oh. at you tilt your head back. Ah, uh, Chicklets Cup. It launched the beer there. Get no, box, I know, a, I know, a, but Poso and Molson on the sandbagger. We have revived the organization. I'm waiting for a fucking call from the Pagulas to thank me for everything I've done for them. I shaved have your I head in crit- front of 30,000 people. You called the Maple Leafs are going to win three years in a row. You should have no foreskin. And and I don't even know what else you said. Um, The list goes, the, uh, the list goes on and on. You said the Coyotes were going to make the playoffs last year, I think. I'm fucking paid to say that. All right. All right. Don't you sit over there quiet. You had fucking Ottawa winning the cup. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. You got me on that one. Uh, Speaking of the bill, we got to thank everybody who's been buying the big deal brewing all over the place. Sold out everywhere. Sold out everywhere. pocket. I had a case dropped off last week. First round, I whacked about eight of them back sitting here. They're so good. They're so crushable. So this is just a normal Tuesday. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What's uh, what's up today? 
oh fuck you you seen those new big deal brews that just dropped i'd say at least a 12 pack let's get that thing loosened up oh yeah I gotta have a couple my more brother uh, my everybody. brother calling though he'd be honest and he told me yesterday I went over to his place watching football he said these are unreal and then he sent me a picture like six hours later he's still drinking them so i knew he wasn't lying his wife's a big fan they're, they're a solid solid beer and you can have a bunch of them so thank you to everyone who's been giving him a shot all right, thank you for bringing that up before we really dive into the hockey. I did see that picture that you posted, buddy, when you were watching TNT. Uh, to everybody in the original six states where it was launched, the response has been insane. We thank you. We love you. We love all the photos you're sending. Uh, we're trying to snap the love back. Uh, because of, of the response to it, we are trying to speed things up as far as launching in other states quicker. We're hoping that every two, three weeks, it, we can do the cards again and have somebody launch it in, in each of these states that will be coming sooner rather than later. And as far as everybody in Canada who's been asking for it, things are progressing very quickly. We don't have an answer for you just yet. We are hoping as soon as possible and within striking distance, I I want it in Canada as much as anywhere. I love all you can fucking crazy Canucks. And I love that you're bitching because you don't have it yet. We're going to get it to you soon. So thank you to everybody for, for helping the brand out and all the suppliers and everybody who helped restock the shelves and, and, and help with this amazing launch. A lot of border <laughs> towns, though, if you're from Canada, a lot of border towns have the beer. So just drive over the border, grab oh, it and yeah. head back. Oh, yeah. Bad That's boys, really easy. Got to hide it, though, though. Bear, yeah. bury you with taxes, bringing it back. I think don't they do that if you don't claim it? Oh yeah, you with no clue. Yeah. I live on the you, edge. Do it with your even with like card. a case of beer. They'd hit I, you with that. Just, uh, just. I, uh, I think you get one case of beer if you if you're there for like three days. I think you're allowed up to two, maybe without paying tax. But just tell the hey, tell the border agent you're with spitting chiclets, and I'm sure they don't give a shit. Bring ten. Yeah, big. Like, oh, is that that podcast that idiot Bissonette works on? <laughs> <laughs> all right, gang. Before we get to the pucks, let's talk about Pink Whitney for a minute. Right now, we have all four sports in season, so make sure you're all stocked up on Pink Whitney. But if you're not, then head over to your favorite local bar and order a shot of Pink Whitney or mix it with some club soda if you prefer. Either way, enjoy that tasty pink lemonade favorite vodka, Pink Whitney. All right, boys, we're already two weeks into the new season. There are quite a few surprises around the league, but the Buffalo Sabres have to be the biggest. Winning four of their first five games, including a sweep of the three Western Canada teams. Unbelievable. They've outscored opponents 22-11, to 11, and the goaltender has been terrific so far. Eric Carmi, two of his three starts, he's won. He's got a 9-3-0 save percentage. He became the first Sabres goalie to record back-to-back 40 save wins. And 41-year-old Craig Anderson, 2-0 with the 1.00 goals against and a 970 save percentage. Alex Tuck had his first career hat trick. He's got seven points in five games. But Rasmus Dahlin, wait, I know you want to talk about this guy. The first defenseman in NHL history to score in each of his team's first five games of the season. This kid's still only 22 years old. Wait, have you been watching him much or what? I know you said I know you said they're legit now, Buffalo. Yeah, well, so so this 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 is a dream start for this team. And and Biz and I argued a bunch over the offseason and early on about, you know, he still thought this team wasn't near ready to win or near ready to compete for the playoffs. And I completely disagree. Now, granted, this start has been out of this world. It's not going to continue like this. There's going to be ups and downs. But they are here and they are going to be challenging for the playoffs the entire season. I don't think that they'll get in a top three spot in their division, but I believe that they'll be right there for a wild card. Funny enough, if you take them, Ottawa and Detroit, one of them's definitely getting in and you'll see maybe one's really kind of fall off and then maybe another one that doesn't get in and fights till the end. But three interesting teams. But when I go to Buffalo and I go to Darlene, I got to give Granado a lot, a lot of respect in this because this guy went through hell and back, it felt like, the last few years, and he dealt with all this bullshit. And finally, when Eichel left, things seemed to change. We saw the vibe of the game that he was back and they won. We saw Alex Tuck and how much he loves being a Sabre. He looks great already this year. But Darlene's the big piece to me only because he's that first overall pick. It's been a little while. And now, last year you saw the offense, but there's just certain turnovers and there's certain lapses of judgment defensively that really kind of hurt the team five on five, even though you're producing that well as a defenseman. Being a defenseman, you still got to play in your own end. That's been great this year. He's playing with an edge, too. He's kind of a motherfucker to, motherfucker to play against out there. He skates so well. His skill is so great. I think had any defenseman ever scored his first four games, now he's at five. And 
He's showing that he could actually lead this team in scoring. Like, it would not be surprising to me at all. I know Roman Yossi had 96 points last year. Am I expecting that? No. But if he got 80 points, and I was talking Grinelli for the over 55 call or That's something That's what like I'm that. saying. I it's know. looking pretty good now. But, dude, the way this guy is in the offensive zone, he really can can play offensively like a forward can. His vision, his skating, his shot, and it's just changed the team. Now, there's many things to this team that I wonder if kind of is able to is going to be able to stay this way. Goaltending is the biggest one. Yeah. Anderson Anderson has to be able to stay healthy. He's 41 years old. I don't know if that's possible, but if Comrie, who Comrie's could be a, been playing sick. if he could be a, he could be a hidden gem, man. He came from Winnipeg. He looked good over there at times, and now he's kicking phenomenal. But the teams they beat, they beat Florida. They yeah. beat, uh, uh, who have they beat out? Calgary? No, swept oh, I, they swept I think they lost Canada. to Florida. They lost 4-3 to Florida. I okay, that was home. the game they lost, right? But still, still a great game. Very engaged. Tuck and Kachuk were going at it. Like they're fucking competing their balls off. And and they're the youngest team in the league. And and you can tell there's like a culture change there. And that's not at all me saying Jack Eichel was like a, a problem there. We've been over that. But it's just the fact that he's gone and that the questions no longer have to be answered and that they have their core. So Dylan Cousins doesn't even really get mentioned. Stud. Absolute baller. This kid, John Paterko, who's, I think, a second rounder in 2020. He's German. He looks great. And then this is without getting anything. I think Jack Quinn's played three games, has no points. Hannah Stroza, who biz, you saw in Arizona how yeah, he, he could, buzzes. He's dude, fast. two assists in the two, in the first two games. Yeah. I think he was in the lineup. Yeah. They, you could, you could take over, but this team isn't really going anywhere. I, I, it's because they play a certain way. They are exciting and they're fast and the youth. The youth is so contagious with that team. And then the fan base is just so rabid about them that I think it's an exciting time to be a Sabres fan. I don't think they're going to continue like this, but they're going to be there all year. I'm telling you. Yeah, I'm well, I'm not going to apologize for being too hard on them. And I'm I still need to see a lot more like like let's just even look at this little stretch they got now. They just went to Western Canada and they swept the trip. Incredible job. Credit where it's due. They had this team prepared right from fucking puck drop coming in the regular season to compete. Was saying that they're going to be a lottery pick team by the end of the year, maybe a bit too harsh. OK, sure. Maybe I'll say that. But they got Montreal. They got Chicago and the crack in the next three games. Those are games now, if you're going to consider yourself of a higher stature, you got to win, you gotta win two of the three. You got to string some together. Seattle you looks good, though. Se- Seattle looks a lot better than they did when I fucking chirped them during the first uh, and second intermission when they were playing St. Louis the other night on TNT. Because before that, guys, just a boring team to watch with not much identity. But you look at their roster, and they got some fucking gamers. And I know I'm jumping around. Let's go back to Buffalo. I'm going to keep a close eye on them and see what they can do against these teams that they're fucking supposed to be. Cracking aside, hey, I know Montreal's playing good hockey, but if you want to be a, a playoff team, these are games you can't, you can't, you can't miss. You got to be able to string some together after proving that you go out west and beat some big boys. So, I mean, congratulations, you cost Cal- you, you caught Calgary on an off night. They've had a few emotional games. Whoop de fucking do. Let's not plan the parade, but congratulations on a team that needed needed to have a good start. It's crazy, though. Like, I'm just going through the lineup. Darlene, 22. Tuck, 26. Like, Tuck, that's not very old. 26 years old. He's got seven points in five games. Olofsson, 27. Middlestat, 23. That's a player to keep your eye on because that is a guy. If Middlestat? He takes that, if Middlestat can get 50, 60 points during the playoffs, he's a good I heard it here first. Then you go, like, Paterka, 20. Tage Thompson, 24. Cousins, 21. It's nuts, dude, how young they are. Not even mentioned. Owen Powers, 19. It is going to be a tough thing for them to deal with their division and how many good teams are in the Eastern Conference. But this team's this team's fun to watch. I'll say that. And I remember watching. I remember Buffalo being on TV and just being like, oh, Jesus. Boring. Now I'm now I'm, I'm going to ESPN plus I'm tuning into their games. Let's partly see, because let's my, see, my uh, reputation. Let's see halfway through the year how these 4 a.m. bar closures take care of them. Let's see how, if they're if they're not getting sucked. And there's in a lot of big hype. deal brewing up there. There's a lot of big deal brewing. And I'll tell you what, Buffalo, it's a sleeper town. We uh, it ate us place. and spit us out at, at Chicklet's Cup. Great these place. guys got to do a whole season. We'll see. And and the Bills are doing as good as they're doing. They're getting dragged out on Sundays to celebrate. So we'll see. Let's not uh, let's pump the brakes a little bit. There's uh it's a few, yeah, I understand games. six games or whatever it is, five games. But let me tell you, it could have been a hell of a lot worse. 
And when you start like this, it's only five games, but it's a culture change and it's an attitude where you're like, all right, we could do it. People don't people fans don't understand that. Like when you're like, it's been five games, who cares? Like, dude, that could change an entire vibe around a locker room. Like if you start one and four, it's like, oh, what are we doing again? Yeah, now they have the confidence. Selves. Absolutely. It does feel like they turned a little bit of a corner here. Not they're not over the hump yet. It's still a lot of ways to go. But early in the season, it feels like things a little turn around a little bit for the for the team. Uh, hey, the I'll tell you. I'll tell you this though. I'm going to hammer them on the Barstool Sportsbook app. This whole that whole three game stretch there. Yeah. I'll, I'm going to go. I'm going to. What's the when you got the two goals? The puck line or the money line? The, well, the, the puck Jesus line is line? my puck lines when you when you lay in minus one and a half goals. You got to win by two or more. I'll remember I'll, when this every team, game. Every game, I'll do that. Remember when that we we should mention? I think they were a different team, but I think they were like leading the division a couple years ago and won twelve of the final sixty games. Kind of like how the Bills did for a while. They'd start out four and zero, be up on the division, and then the Bills are a wagon now. Not right now, I know. But uh, who else we got? Ra? Anything you guys got to say on the on, on the Sabers? Anything that we're not covering? I will not put out a wagon shirt for the Buffalo Sabres. Don't I've even gotten, think about it. I've gotten lots of tweets. I've gotten death threats saying, don't do it, Grinelli. Don't do it. So hand up now. Not doing the wagon shirt. I'll tell you this. If they go 3-0 and in these next three games, we're dropping it after the Canadians game. That's the third game. That's on you. You made that decision, not me. Death threats send him business way. That's a win-win. We'll win. He gets the merch money, or he could say, "I told well, you, this no, team it's, sucks." It's, it's going to see. Are, are they going to buy into the hype? Are they going to remain focused and keep off their phones and not worry about the wagon shirts? They can call us whatever they want. We're going to keep winning some hockey games. It biz, I, I've been looking at them. Yeah, I've watched a few Sabres games. They're getting this much production already, and they still have guys that have, haven't even scored yet. I don't think Jeff Skin has had a goal. A bunch of other guys on the on the depth there haven't scored. So. The best is yet to come, I'd say, for this team. You know, that's my All take right. anyways. All right. Uh, another team that people didn't have expectations for much, the Philadelphia Flyers. They started out 4-1. and one. They lost yesterday 4-2 and two now. It's early, but uh, again, the culture change has already happened. It's already paying dividends. Just those first few games, they look the opposite of the team we saw last year at Philadelphia. Big reason why? Kind of hot. 4-0 oh, uh, with a 175 goals against, 949 save percentage, and they've somehow done it winning only... 38% of their face-offs. That's insane. 38% of their face-offs, and they're somehow 4-2. and two. Uh, On Sunday, though, however, Hazy and Konecki did get benched in the third period. Uh, Torts was asked about it. He said, I'm just going to keep that in the room. Uh, the team is also going with a captain for the first time since 92-93. Uh, in the very first game, only Scott Lawton wore, wore the A. Tortorella said, because I don't think anybody else should be wearing it right now. I don't think anybody's shown me that. Lots has. So they look like a much different team, but how long can they maintain this level, Paul? Oh, they you got to feel like an asshole mean. in the locker room if you're lots, eh? The boys must, oh. must just be, oh, yeah. You're the you're, one guy, Scotty. You're the one guy, man. You're the one guy. Hazy must just be going. Uh, keep in mind, they're boys. Uh, have you heard why Hazy got benched? Did you end up seeing? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he has no idea why. I, 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 but here's the thing. like, Hazy has eight points in six games. Konechny has seven points or six yeah. points in six games. At the time, were they down one nothing when they got benched already? What what t- did they get benched for the entire third? This is the mind like, torpedoes that these yeah. t- types but, of coaches throw. But my times. argument and, and tor- there's like no doubt, Torts is he was going to come in and he was going to make these guys play hard, and he's able to do that. He's able to completely change like a mindset of a team. But when is the the point of like, all right, well, let's try to win this game against the lowly Sharks Sunday night? and not bench these guys who are my two leading scores. I mean, maybe they did something that was worthy of getting benched, but to me, it's like, all right, let's maybe talk to him after, but try to get this dub first. Maybe that's why I'm a podcast host and I could never think of even coaching a Wee team, but it was surprising to see as you're down one, nothing or whatever it was to bench your two top scores. Yeah. Cause it's cause you, the points are so valuable and it against a team like that, if, if you, you know, you continue to roll them out, if they could just get it tied up, it's like, you know, you got to, do it there. If you're if you're getting speed bagged five two by exactly. a sick team and you're in the third, then you set your example. But yeah, maybe it's maybe he thinks that lesson's worth showing his team now in the season, given with where they are. And I'll say this: I watched the game when they were on on TNT, and fuck, do they give up a lot of like odd man rushes, and they have a lot of breakdowns, and they're giving up a lot of high quality scoring chances. <laughs> A lot of which were with D'Angelo on the ice. And I'm not shitting on him because I think he does a lot of amazing things with the puck. And one of the things that was communicated apparently from towards them is he wants their D-man playing fast. But 
and this could be for a lot of teams, like early in the season, like w- when you're supposed to go over and like cross as defensemen. And nor- normally most teams who are pretty structured, you want your D staying on the same side. But there was multiple, multiple, multiple times where there were just these little breakdowns and odd man rushes against. Like Florida was eating them alive. And if it wasn't for that Felix kid, who's I think it was his sixth NHL start. I, I don't know how to say his last name. You could look it up, Grinnell. But he saved their bacon numerous times. We actually, me and Talk had an argument about the one goal. So as as good as their record is, they're not that good. They ain't that like unless they clean things up as far as the high quality scoring chances, there's no way that they're going to be able to get the sustained goaltending. But because fuck. When I say breakdowns, I mean like full fledged half ice. Like they gave up a a two on one D'Angelo, then right back the other way. And then Verhagi had a breakaway. Like same shift. How the fuck can you give up a two on one and then a breakaway? That's Felix Sandstrom, biz. Felix Sandstrom. Sandstrom. I thought, hey, I'll tell you what. I, I think Carter Hart has been tremendous. This kid against Florida. He made some insane athletic saves. Without him, they they would have lost that game, the eight three or whatever the, the the final was. But um, we'll get and we'll get to Florida later. But but overall, like from what I saw from from an eye perspective, uh, they, they've been out to a very fortunate beginning. I wonder if he's just making an example of them. Even if they didn't, the both of them didn't necessarily do something wrong. Maybe just to show the rest of the team, like if that's psycho off, shit. Is, yeah, just do it the head game. Just oh, to yeah, let yeah, them know. That, that's insane shit. That's like Doctor Evil. Uh, also, we want to uh, send our best wishes to Nashville's uh, Mark Borowicki, Borowicki the other day versus Philly. He got injured with that awful, awkward collision behind the net. They had to take him off on the stretcher to be uh, precautious, but he was conscious, moving all his extremities. He's he's home and resting now. But you know, he's a tough fella, and it wasn't even during a fight. It was just a, an un. un what do you call it? Inadvertent check. He got buried right into the boards. It was real tough to watch, but it was a versus Philly. So we want to say, uh, say best wishes to him. So uh, fly is a playoff possibility, or is this going to no. go off the hill? Okay. No dice. <laughs> All right. Moving right along. It, it, uh, in, in, in the same, in the same breath though, like if they're, they're not going to be last year, if, if they're able to work out those, those issues, once apparently Ellis is done for the year, but fuck, if they could get him back, man, he is a competent, competent top four. But right now they're missing uh, 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 in Couturier. Who, and and they're missing Couturier, who's a big piece up the middle, a guy who can shut down other teams' top lines to relieve some stress where, like, like you know, Hazy and those guys, he's more of a playmaker. He wants to play with the puck and, and you know, and, and even play a little bit more run and gun. Couturier can like chew up a fucking a really good center across the ice. So they, if they get those guys back and they can tune things up defensively, I could see them competing just because Torts will keep them engaged in the fight. But they got to get healthy and they got to work those those fucking issues out. Uh, the way I described it on the broadcast, wit is D'Angelo's a riverboat gambler, like the modern day version. I, I, it's hard to even compare him to somebody else, like Brett Favre, but he wouldn't steal money from taxpayers <laughs> and and poor people, like an absolute scumbag. He is a gunslinger. He is a gunslinger. Before we uh, continue, guys, I need to talk to you about Chevy. From Bolt to Blazer, Equinox to Silverado, Chevy EVs are for everyone everywhere. A few of Chevrolet's beloved and best-selling have been designed as electric vehicle models powered by Utium for an all-electric future. Equinox EV, Blazer EV, and Silverado EV are powered by Utium. Now that's one heck of a hat trick. Chevrolet has electric vehicles available now. Buy now the Bolt EV and the Bolt EUV. Reserve now the Blazer EV and the Silverado EV. They are affordable. You don't have to be rich to have an EV. All-star capability on a rookie's budget. With an established full-line brand like Chevrolet, we can offer multiple EV vehicles with the volume, variety, and the value customers all over the world have come to expect. If you need space for the whole team to be comfortable or want an affordable, fun EV that can go the distance, Chevrolet is where it's at. Over 2,000 certified EV dealerships, along with a growing network of public charging stations to help you live electric. Finally, charging won't put you in the penalty box. The lineup is the Bolt EV and the Bolt EUV. Skills that leave the ankle burners in the dust. The Equinox EV is room for your entire bench like where Biz sat. And the Blazer EV is a team beauty. The Silverado EV is room for the starters, their boots, and their lumber. So Chevy is where it's at. Check it out now. Thank you. Uh, all right. Now, on the other end of the spectrum is Vancouver. 
The Canucks have yet to win in six tries. 0-4 and 2, the only winless team in the league right now. They're also the first team to blow multiple goal leads and lose four straight games, a new NHL record. Team had a players-only meeting after just three games. And their own coach, Bruce Bruce Boudreau, said his team looked, quote, afraid to win and mentally weak, and that were being way too cute. The penalty kill is less than 50%. They've allowed seven goals on 13 power plays. 27 goals allowed goals allowed is the second worst. And then the other night, their home opener. I don't think I've ever seen this before, Biz, at a home opener. They got booed for the last five minutes of it, and then they tossed jerseys on the ice. Just an awful scene for a home opener. And then after that, uh, GM Jim Rutherford went on. He said, it was hard to watch and that the team's structure isn't good. They had a bad camp, and we may very well be in a rebuild in the direction we're going. Bro, he was Ooh. on after hours, after it, the home opener. Nuts. Yeah. Which, yeah. guys, I was watching American, that live. For you American like, oh my listeners, God. This is this isn't like a two minute in and out. This is a you know, a good fifteen, 15 minutes minute conversation. And um, <clears throat> Ari, I, I think that you just mentioned it. The one thing that stuck out was like we didn't have a good training camp. It's like you didn't have a good training camp. Mm. Like holy shit! After you know a season like last year, and with all these young guns and expectations, like you think that you would come in and I mean you. Th- I'll tell you what, like, yeah, maybe Philly isn't there and they're having some breakdowns, but I tell you what, they were ready from puck drop to win some hockey games because you knew they had a fucking training camp where they were going to be alert and attentive and and minor details to the game were going to be paid attention to. And playing a certain style is all cute and dandy if you got all these skilled players. But guys, if you ain't paying attention to the details of the game, you're going to get fucking bent over at this level. You could also blame the fact that we talked about it in the previews that their back end is a little bit banged up and they don't have, but guess what? Guess what? So is Florida's. And I see the way that their skill fours fucking compete and play and and make it work and, and make sure that they're relieving pressure off of that along with good goaltending, which Vancouver has as well. They're fucking making it work. I don't give a shit about what excuses you have. The time is now, man. You keep hearing about... I also mentioned I thought that they rushed the rebuild. Mind you, they do, do, did get their best player out of it, but... And, th- and now, apparently, I don't know if you read this with the fucking... They're harassing him at the pumpkin patch, JT Miller. That's what it's like playing in Canada, man. The sky's falling right now. I don't know if there's any truth to this story, but he's trying to get away with his family. I could only imagine the the vessel, the brain... Uh, vein that would pop in your forehead would if you're at the you know in Edmonton at the pumpkin patch with your family and all of a sudden some guy comes grilling you about you snapping around the power play Whew. you might I'll fucking smash this. a pumpkin off his head I'll tell you yeah then he'd probably be a lefty and pump my eyes shut and get beat <laughs> up by a fan and be minus eight through four games let me say this though about Vancouver the most alarming thing is People throwing each other under the bus oh, already. Gross. We got we got Rutherford, who, without saying it, basically said Bruce Boudreau is a horrible coach. What are those? <laughs> seriously, what are those comments? We had a horrible camp. He said we play with no structure, Oof. or we or we or we need some sort of structure. We need better structure. Then Boudreau saying how unprofessional the players are. It's just passing the buck, passing the blame. And it's amazing to see because I picked this fucking team to be top three in the Pacific, for Christ's sake. What was I thinking? They yeah. suck. And, and, and there were expectations because of the record being that good when Boudreaux took over last year. But it was kind of evident in the summer when they were possibly they, – they, they didn't give him an um, extension. They didn't give Boudreaux an extension. They were calling around, looking around for a possible other coach. No, we're going to stick with Boudreaux. And then – Five games in, you're you're carving the camp, you're carving the preparation as the president, and then the coach is carving the players, and it's just like, holy shit. But I'll say this. I hate Vancouver Canucks fans, one of the worst group of people in the world. But I feel so bad for these players. And the reason is, like, I was in Edmonton for all these years when we sucked, and it sucks. It is so brutal to lose in pro sports. It's brutal to be on a college team and to be losing, let alone in Canada, in the NHL. It's like, so you mentioned that the, the possibility, whether it's true or fake, of, of JT Miller getting a, a abused by fans at the pumpkin patch looking for a hayride for his son. <laughs> and you just think back, to, I think back to the days of eating a steak and just being told how much I suck at Earl's in Edmonton. I'm at the West Edmonton Mall looking to get a new pair of kicks at Aldo. Can you fucking leave me alone, please? And and it's not fair to the players. But at the same time, 
that's what it is. It's pro sports. You make a lot of money and people are going to say what they want to say and they're going to chuck jerseys on the ice. But for JT Miller to sign this summer and then have the quote today, they could throw their shit on the ice if they want to. Uh, it, it's just it's such a toxic environment there right now. And it's so early in the season. Boys, they got Carolina tonight. I know that's they, got, so, they haven't won a game and they're playing the best one of the best teams in the league. Yeah. So what's was... going to happen in this game and how long it, can it continue to have Boudreaux there or to have this core there? I mean, when Rutherford says maybe we're going to end up being in a rebuild with how we look right now, there's just as a fan of the Canucks, you're just like, what is going on? How is this happening this early in the season? And and to, to be that separate and to be that off base with each other as terms of the president and the coach and then the players and having a players only meeting three games in. Now, I will say before I turn over to R.A. or whatever. The only bright side may be they had two goal leads in the first four games. <laughs> so there was times they were they were playing well. Yeah. And even Boudreaux mentioned in the Buffalo drubbing that they played amazing in the second period. They're down two to one and then they get outscored three nothing in the third. So I think two of them were empty netters, but they have played some decent hockey and stretches. It's just not being able to finish a game. But for me, it's looking at the, the, the pass and the block and playing the blame game. That is what's scary when you look at an entire organization and team. And I think that the, it was the two goal lead thing that would drive a fan to be mad enough to, yeah. to attack JT Miller at the end of the hay maze. Now, some of you fans might say, you know, you have the right to do that because of the amount of money he's making. And others will say that I think that the person who met him at the end of the hay maze deserves to be behind bars. So I think we can move on from the Canucks. I think we've gave him enough of a tongue lashing. Now, do you guys think that a possibility of, of changing coaches like, do you think that that could happen this soon in the season? You mentioned they're playing Carolina. They're playing a Carolina team who just lost on the road to to Edmonton and Calgary, I, right? I, and Calgary. I, I, so I they're, they're going to trump them. So, so like they're li- like Rod the Bod had a five thirty a.m. wake out and he, wake up and he was licking his chops. He probably had a steak for lunch. And that's it. And he's salivating at the opportunity to bend this Vancouver. I, I wonder if last year there was even a time when Carolina lost three games in a row. They were that consistent. So good luck, Vancouver. And and then on top of that, let's say that's a loss. The next one is against a rival, the Kraken, and that stupid buoy troll, their their mascot, who cost them the game against St. Louis. With your he was, nose. He was my gla- ears. he was glass banging right before the goal started. That's karma, buoy. You're welcome for getting you verified on Twitter. Ari, have you been paying attention to this Vancouver team? Like, what do you, I mean, is that as big of a under the bus uh, drumming by coach and GM you've seen? But it all seems to go down to the players because Bruce said after that same game, it just looked like there was very little effort. And as far as the coaching question you just brought up is, uh, Bruce got there before Rutherford did. He asked for an extension after Rutherford took the job. Rutherford did not give him an extension. So he's essentially a lame duck coach right now. Uh, I don't think he's going to be sticking around for the whole season at, at this point. I can't imagine that they're going to. We all wow. know GMs want their own coach. It's just it's it's just a clusterfuck. Why hire a coach then bring in a new GM when it creates this exact scenario? So, you know, I'm sure they'll if, give it another, another eight to ten games and see if they get their ass in gear. And if not, yeah, they'll, they'll probably make a move here. By the way, if I'm Bo Horvat, who is just a gamer, right? You could call out the captain of this team with how things are going, but this guy is a consistent goal scorer, tough to play against, and he's a UFA. I am never even considering signing there. Look at yeah. look at J, JT Miller's got about fucking nine years left. No, look at this team. He's Horvat, get me out of here. JT Miller's out of there in 13 months. I said if he lasts two seasons, I'd be shocked. I know, but who's going to? It's a big salary. I know Cap's going to jump up four and a half True. million True. once. Uh, True. What, what, once they say? Once, like, once, gets they, better. once they <laughs> once the HHR. Uh, gets back to even they're going to bump it up potentially four and a half million next year that's a big rise so I don't know uh, I think that was pretty much it on Vancouver yeah just another note JT Miller following up on that if you see a guy out with his family just leave him alone man like family kids whatever just go you know if you don't see him again too bad but don't bother people with their family especially when the team's doing shitty and then giving the players shit just Knock that shit off. Whatever, do, you think, uh, fan of. do you think Bruce is still doing cameos right now? Uh, that might be a tough look if Rutherford <laughs> sees that he's doing cameos. Oh, shit. Uh, this is a wild stat. Uh, oh, Rutherford does a cameo to fire him. <laughs> hey, yeah. Bruce, this is Jim here. You're fired. <laughs> wait, wait a minute. That oh, sounds shit. like a job I have. Is this real? 
Um, Bruce yeah, Boudreaux's can... cameo account is temporarily unavailable, so it looks oh, like he has disabled on, it. Come on, oh, just a couple losses, man. People want to see you. Oh, uh, there's a wild stat I found over the weekend. It may have changed by a couple percentage points, but 20% of games have seen a team come back from a multi-goal deficit win. That's one out of every five games a team is coming back being down two or more. That's something that was unthinkable 30 years ago in this league, and now it's it's a pretty common thing to happen. So I think it's That's just indicative early, of the talent. That's early season, just defensive yeah. breakdowns, the amount of guys who are confused and – Hey, maybe, maybe the NHL was right. Maybe they do need more of these uh, preseason games to get these guys' brains turned on. Mm. Fuck, they already get, what, eight of them? Maybe I don't know. Maybe it's like too much, so they just get in this like uh, preseason mode where there's just breakdowns all over the place. I think th- tighten them up then and get them, get all the real players out there. No offense to the not guys who don't make the team. <laughs> oh, so you, so you don't want to have a beer leaguer out there anymore? <laughs> we can move on. Gee, you sent me over this tweet earlier. Wow, incredible. All I could say about this new fall collection from Chicklets and Pink Whitney, keeps you warm, makes you looking fresh. What do we got, G? We got tons of hats. You guys have seen me wearing these hats for the past few months. We have Pink Whitney hats. We have the new Pink Whitney logo, new Chicklets hats. We have these new Unreal Pink Whitney hoodies that are incredible. Uh, new Pink Whitney hoodies as well that aren't Unreal. New Chicklets hoodies. We have everything across the board. All you got to do is go to barstoolsports.com slash chicklets to get the merch there. It's an entire new fall merch launch. It's unbelievable. Like I said, just go to barstoolsports.com slash chicklets. All right, we can move on. Another team struggling out of the gate pretty bad. Nobody expected the Minnesota Wild to be 1-3-1 and one after five games. Not only that, the first three games they lost, they gave up 20 goals. Uh, they beat the connection over time to get off the schneid. Then they lost an OT to Boston. A uh, very rough start for Mark Andre Fleury. One one and one with a five two five goals against eight four seven save percentage. His backup Gustafson, zero and two with a five zero six and an eight six zero. So Biz, I know you want to talk about this. Did they fuck up by trading Talbot or not handling it different, or is this just an early? No, I mean that's just like that's just hindsight. But I I feel like the flex was there where you know it seemed like they think this this Gustafson kid was was ready to go, and. I mean, hey, it, it's still early. They still have a really good makeup of a team. But I will say I felt that there was a lot of magic involved in last season. They just had the – you know, you talked about how how much a good start and and having a good group can can help kick things off at the beginning of the season. You mentioned with, with Buffalo earlier, Whit. I felt like last year they got off to that. And, I mean – Never look back. F- 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 you know, f- I still think that Flower can figure things out. It, it was just seemed like a lot of his success over the, you know, the last bit of his career has come with a one-two punch and getting help from 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 another netminder, and that's really the way that the whole league's moving. So, he he, I think his comments were like, "I deserve to be booed" because he got booed one night, and he's like, "I deserve it. I've been playing like shit." So, I I, I love the accountability. And I think that the fan base appreciates it rather than a guy maybe going the other way with it. But there's just, there's, there's also more issues than goaltending right now. And they lost Fiala. We talked about how much of an offensive impact he was to that, to that top six. And they seem to be okay with, with getting rid of him. I know there was some comments online when he took a stupid penalty with the first game with LA, like he takes a lot of them, like, holy shit, bitter X, why not? Uh, but, but yeah, there's, that's just a fucking ugly start, man. And, uh, I, I was not bullish on them coming in with that 10 million anchor attached to them. That's two I, competent players in your lineup that you could have helping out and pick up, pick you up in certain areas. That's a great, that's a great, you know, that's a great top four defenseman. That's another, you know, potentially a really elite third line center. That's a, that's a, those are two big pieces. And I just, it's hard, man. It's hard playing with like, look, look at every good team. They're all up to the cap. Some of which on long-term are, you got 10 million in cap space in today's age. You're fucking hooped, man. Dead cap hooped. space. But in terms of every team in the league off to a tough start, off to a start that they could not or would not imagine, I am at least worried about the Wild. I really am because I think Flurry figures it out a little bit. Actually, I know he's going to play better than he is. You got two goalies. Both their goals against are over five right now. Uh, if the goaltending continues to be this bad, they're fucked. But you could say that about any single team in the league. Look at what Jersey's done since they started getting a little goaltending. We can we can talk I, about I, them. I, see, I have a pushback on that. Okay, I, hold on. Wait one ahead. second about what mini then. The reason that I, I think I think that those goaltenders can get it figured out, but 
in terms of other issues, last year, Hartman, he had over 30 goals. He's had a slow start, right? I don't think Dumba's played great from what I'm reading, what I'm talking to in terms of the some of the reporters that follow that team. So I, I think that there's guys who need to pick up their, their game. But overall, you got to get stops in this league, dude. There's no chance. You got no chance. You got Zuccarello playing awesome already. You got Kaprasov. He's going to get 100 points. Kaprizov, however the fuck you say his name. And there's other guys there that are going to pick it up. You just need goaltending and you need saves. And at some point, they're going to get it. I don't think they're going to be as good as last year because of the issues they're dealing with, but I don't think they're this bad. Yeah. I think Dumba's you, uh, viewed as a little bit of a, a riverboat gambler yeah. as well. You know, it plays a, like it's sometimes with those guys when they're in rhythm and in flow, you're like, holy shit, this is beautiful. And then other times when it's not, it's like, oh shit, okay, a lot of mistakes. That just how I, I described D'Angelo not too long ago. Uh, we're going to get to the, the comment about goaltending, though, early on with New Jersey when we move on to them. But, G, remind me to circle back on pushing back on the goaltending early on. because I Well, Jersey goal. looks better. Well, yeah, they're, yeah they, they, were, they were playing. We'll get to them after. Go ahead, R.A. Sorry. No problem. Uh, we also want to congratulate you, you guys, friend. The Goose, Alex Goligoski, played his 1,000th NHL game. I know you tweeted about it. It had some nice words to say about him. He's a good pal. Both he is, right? Oh, great person. Salt of the earth. One of those Minnesota guys. They're just great guys, you know, but it's yeah. just nice people. Awesome. And and I think that um, in terms of being one of the one of the reasons I was traded from the Penguins, I could be bitter. I could be upset, <laughs> but I'm not because I like Goose and we lived together and we took Ambience and played NHL and never remembered the outcomes. But a great <laughs> guy and a hell of a career. And, and I hope to catch up with him soon. I hope to grab dinner some point with him and, and catch up because that's amazing that he's got a thousand games. It's, it's quite quite an impressive uh, number for him to reach. Just a pro's pro, great skater, gr- did a uh, so intelligent out there. A great job evolving his game. Like he, you know, he was a, a, a offensive defenseman. I would agree with that. He was coming up, and Latang was coming up around the time where when you were there, and the, he uh, was also a cheaper option. So they had a safety valve and. I mean, he was fuck. He skated like the wind. He still oh. he, he still moves good for an older guy. But um, when he was at the Coyotes, even just like penalty killer, always in the shot lane. Like as, as maybe as skinny as he is, he's a fucking warrior and he competes hard. So just an, the fact that he's still playing, I don't know how the fuck these guys with their their bodies at this age. I know, like thirty seven. Like what are you? You turning thirty eight soon, or are you thirty? You're turning thirty eight this year, right? Thirty eight in March. I, I think. How I are these saying, guys doing this? No clue. They must be taking steroids. I mean, they must not have beers and vodka that they're selling out of their asshole all day long and drink it to prove that it's good. But I mean, I, I certainly know that I've been retired seven years now. I mean, <laughs> I couldn't imagine. I could barely play seven years ago. And they're still doing it, these guys. When you see a pro athlete, especially the NHL, 37 years old or older, like, what the fuck? Pavelski's 39, I think. The guy had a hat trick the other night. He looks amazing again. Yeah, he does. He looks good, too. Man rocket. It's crazy. Next up, the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, last season's worst team started out 3-3, three and three, not too shabby. The team really looks like, like having fun out there. I mean, I know they're probably not going to play us, but they look like a team having fun on the ice. And the, the big name everyone's talking about, we mentioned him before, rookie Abra, Jack Eye. He had his first NHL scrap with Zach Cassian, and I'd say he got the W there, Biz. Uh, and Eric, our buddy Eric Engels uh, asked him about it. He says, I was smiling, uh, smiling at him on the face-off. He asked me what I was laughing about. I said, you. He gave me a shot. I asked him if he wanted one. He said, sure. Uh, asked Jack, I have Cassie and said anything after. He said, good fight and off to the benches. So just feel like these stories, young guy looking to make his bones, goes to an older guy, gives him the fight. Uh, you said, Biz, he kind of reminds you like maybe of, of a 2-2 type player or a PJ Stock and just kind of aggravating Like a little cultish team. Biz? Yeah, just because yeah. I, I was hearing about this guy before he done any type of noise in the in the NHL level. And then like you saw in preseason, he was running around and and next thing you know, he's up and he's fucking fighting. And I mean, he won the fight. It was, I mean, I think I think he surprised Cassian, and he's just this young kid who's full of piss and vinegar. And then he ends up getting his uh, first NHL goal against Dallas. I know they lost the game, but seems like you know once in a while one of these like little cult heroes pops up. And I mentioned PJ Stock on that list. I, I I don't know how many games Stalker ended up playing, but I think that when when he probably got called up or made the team in a training camp, at a certain point you heard about this fucking little guy running around just being a fucking pest who is full of piss and vinegar. No, 
Oh yeah, mixing up. He, he beat up the whole Ottawa Senators team during the preseason, so they're gonna be out for blood. And, and and there you go. So there's even more to look forward to in in today's NHL. You don't really get a lot of this because fuck, they don't even allow a lot of kids like that in junior anymore. So how the fuck are you gonna end up getting to the pros? And the most you can fight in junior now is five times. So for him to take on a a wily veteran in Cassian who's got no visor on and have the showing that he did. Yeah, I'm paying attention. And then it comes out the backstory. Was it Eric Engels who came out with the story of how he got the, the nickname Wi-Fi? I yeah, think was, he was doing a scrum. That was hilarious. Which though. is hilarious. So add on to this, uh, this mystique, the new William Wallace. And, and for people great- who don't know, his name, Arbor Jacki, is actually his last name, Jacki, is spelt X-H-E-K-A-J. And somebody said to him, oh, why is your nickname Wi-Fi? And he said, because my last name's usually like what you use for a Wi-Fi password. <laughs> so very original, very funny, and yep. an amazing story. Undrafted, played as an overager last year in Hamilton. I think he's in Kitchener. Then he's in Hamilton. Had a sick run in the playoffs. Montreal invites him to prospect camp. Does well. Ends up signing a deal. My good friend Billy Ryan, uh, a scout for uh, works with Montreal Canadiens. He sent me the he sent me this kid's info and name and story last year. I think at one point he's working at Costco and they sent me, they sent me this at the prospect camp. He beat the shit out of some kid. I think on the Ottawa prospect camp, you can look that up. And it's like, he said, wait, watch this kid. He's going to be a fucking cult hero. Turns out he makes the team. He's got three points in six games. He's got this fight now. And the fact that he's able to do this being undrafted and then able to kind of prove so many people wrong it's just a great story. And and I think that you're going to see more of him being willing. And, and now the eyes are open, right? If you're willing, if you're a guy that's willing and looking to fight in this league, now you see him beat up. Cassian's a tough dude. And he's a lefty, isn't he? Biz? You know what, Wit? I, I didn't check the game notes, bud. And, well, uh, I never checked why the game My notes. nose looks like a Chris Drury curve. And I probably should have checked what, which way a guy's punched. <laughs> but still, it's a great story. And it's kind of one of those... Storylines that Montreal's running with this year. They got Slavkovsky getting his first goal. Um, they got the Jack Eye guy. They got Caulfield's already got four goals in six games. And it's going to be a team that's not going to get in the playoffs. But like I already mentioned, exciting to watch. Instead of the old Buffalo, the old Montreal, you never wanted to even watch a game. Now I'll, I'll tune into this team. I'll see what's going on. Wait, you also mentioned that 20 year old defenseman, Caden Goulet. He's made a hell of an impression so far, taken 16th overall in 2020, spent uh, last year in the O. Now he's playing top pair minutes on this team. He looks like a bona fide number one. I know you want to talk. He's him nasty. Out. He's nasty. He's got all, all the things in the package that you'd need to be an elite top defenseman. And, and I think that that's one of those things where Kent Hughes comes in and you look, all right, what's been going on here? There needs to be change. And you're like, oh, I like this draft pick. I wasn't a part of this, but thank you for this one. So you're able to get a defenseman who moves so well. I think right as of right now, um, I don't know if he's running the top power play. That might be Chris Weidman, but it's still a guy who has a bright future. And being that young, it's what we talked about with Buffalo. It's like all these guys growing together. What I saw in Pittsburgh, a bunch of us kind of growing up together and learning the league and learning how to be competitive in games. It's like it's going to be a bright future in Montreal. And that's another reason right there is they have this young defenseman, a former first round pick already playing big minutes, who's going to have his struggles this year. But overall, I bet you if you talk to Canadians fans from game one to game 82, you're going to see a big improvement and a guy just kind of come into his own in this league. So I love his game so far from what I've watched. Have you guys been seeing these like TikTok or Instagram videos of uh, the quotes that Martin St. Louis has been dropping at these press conferences? No. Oh, my. These reporters are just spank bank material. Okay. They're just jamming themselves to like one the other day. It's like uh, it was a question. He's like, well, my job's not to coach the guy with the puck. It's to teach the the other four guys who don't have it. (sighs) Oh, just fuck. The people in the comments going absolutely berserk. Oh, land. So or how about a comment like like he could have say something like, uh, like, you know, Caulfield maybe goes three games without a goal and they ask him, he says, you know what, though? I've been watching the film. I've been watching this guy away from the puck. I've been watching this guy in the defensive zone. And don't you worry about the three games, no goals, because the other side of the ice is doing his job and he's growing as a player. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so right not. now, I would say that if there's a head coach that has media by the balls, it's Martin St. Louis. They, whatever he is putting up, they are soaking in. Are there any other NHL head coaches that are Hall of Famers as players currently? 
Um, I would say that Rob Brindamore deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Oh, uh, he, uh, that that's kind of my argument uh, at a certain point in time with what Brindamore. he's. Pro- yeah. I think because of what he's going to provide as a coach, they will put him in as a player. He has played, I think, easily over fifteen hundred games. I think he's got over twelve hundred points. He's got a Stanley Cup. Okay, so he doesn't have fifteen hundred games, and he doesn't have twelve hundred points. Well, what, what, what's he got then? What's he got? He's got fourteen eighty four games. He's got eleven eighty four points. Oh, got- fuck off! Come on, give it to I me. I know, but I mean, when you just said he's got over. 1500 games and over fucking 1200 points he doesn't have either i had to call your ass out but yeah man i mean that's that's a whole bad for off the top of the dome though all right so if you got if you got um mogilney ronick or brindamore who you going with pk (laughs) (laughs) oh fuck off another note on (laughs) Brindamore, ne- Brindamore's big. Brindamore. No, had- we're going into the PK talk for ten minutes as punishment for bringing it back up. <laughs> no, <laughs> everybody can make it a non fast forward option now on the podcast. Grinnell, everybody has to endure ten minutes of this. Imagine if we could lock the fast forward option yeah, on this yeah. podcast. No! <laughs> we um, immediately have like seven listeners. It's it's it. I would say all three of those people are in a, in the very same class of knocking on the door. But but with what, what Rod the Bod's now doing as a coach and stuff, uh, how do we get it back onto that subject? You, how somebody we, asked. How many oh, I, I asked if there's coaches. any other uh, coaches that were okay. All so the answer, players. the short answer was probably not. No, no. That's why he's got the media by the balls. One of the there best players. <laughs> Wait, I want to go back to that. that. Was a long way to get there. Go yeah, lay for a sec. When Montreal played uh, Pittsburgh. Goulet was on the ice for 1528 of Sid's 1858. No points in one shot Sid got. So he did a good job shutting down Sid. Another one for you, Biz. Since St. Louis took over on February 10th, 22, Cole Caulfield has the second most even strength goals with 21, trailing only Austin Matthews with 25. Wow. So pretty pretty big thing that they brought in St. Louis after, uh, what's his name, Duchesne or Duchamp, benched them for the whole part of the season. So... Uh, we're about an hour. That guy was in over his head. That Dominic Ducharme. Yeah. Somebody, somebody looking said back he should, now. He should have got the selkie because he shut down Cole Caulfield most of the year. <laughs> waka waka. All right, boys. Do you want to ask send it over? To oh, you didn't like my right joke already? I can't I have fun I, with the, the, I, the teenagers, I, the ones that actually think I'm funny. I gave it a little waka waka. Oh, okay, I got a chuckle. Okay, but um, yeah, I think we should send it over to Ryan Kessler right now. This is a great interview. The guy was an absolute warrior. Talks about a lot of stuff. Left nothing off off the table. So it's good shit. We're gonna go over to him right now. This interview is brought to you by Verizon. There's never been a better time to switch to Verizon than now. And now, if you sign up with Verizon, you can get a deal where the new Google Pixel 7 Pro becomes free. It's the most advanced Pixel to date, super powered to launch even faster, load quicker, and to run smoother. Totally supercharged. And when it's on Verizon, you go to the network America relies on the most along with, of course, a super deal. So like I said, sign up for Verizon to get the new Google Pixel 7 Pro, and you'll love it. Once again, additional terms and conditions may apply. Visit verizon.com for more details. And once again, there's never been a better time to switch to Verizon than now. All right, it's a pleasure to welcome our next guest, This center played over 1,100 regular season and playoff games in a 15-year NHL career that he spent with Vancouver, then Anaheim. He won under-18 gold, World Junior gold, a silver medal at the 2010 Olympics, and the 2011 Selkie Trophy, as well as being a finalist four other times. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Ryan Kessler. How's it going, my man? I'm good, guys. How are you? Doing all right. Can't complain. Oh, we're, we're doing career. great, Kess. This is such a long time coming. My first question: We can go into it. How's the body feeling? And we're going to go into what you sacrificed and your and and what you went through. But how is your health now? Well, first off, Wit, I want to get into how I messaged you on Instagram. I said, "Call me," and you fucking had somebody else call me. No, 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 no. I did. I did. I, did. Ask you. I know, but <laughs> oh yeah, you were going after me for the Pittsburgh owner situation. Let's hear this. One, Let me hear no, this. One. No, no. He did. I did owe you a call. I did owe you a call, yeah. but Grinelli did it on his own. Grinelli, I owed you a call. I was at my brother's wedding. I forgot. I I apologize, buddy. No, it's I've seen. Right. I've I watched enough of your YouTube shit. today. I feel like I talked to you. <laughs> no, but the the body the body's feeling better. Um, I, I I was into one the last couple of years of my career. I you don't know how much pain you're in until you're out of it. 
you know, I'm still going through surgeries. I just had my nose done, which <clears throat> probably was the most painful of all the surgeries. I'm 10 days out right now. As I'm still I'm not good. <laughs> like I was, I was probably in five days of pain where I didn't sleep. I was pacing around my house at night. My wife hated me. My kids were like, what's the matter with daddy sleeps 24 hours a day. <laughs> And it was, it was rough, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out the other side now. Just cause they had the cotton swabs up there. You can only breathe through your mouth and it kind of fucks with your head, doesn't it? Oh yeah. Like complete, like feels like an elephant sitting on your face. It's, it's brutal. So I had that similar surgery, right? Cause obviously one of your septums, I'm sure, or maybe even both of them were closed when they broke mine, like the whole thing shattered and the surgery took like an extra 45 minutes. But like you said, it was like that next week where you're just like, you, you, like you, you got, you have to sleep in a rocking chair. Well, I did anyway, Yeah. because you can't roll over and you don't want to fuck it up. And like you said, it's just like, it, it just messes with your brain. Cause you're not really getting that proper oxygen. But before that, was it so bad that it was still fucking with you where you weren't getting enough oxygen into your body? Yeah, it was completely fucking with me. It was they, uh, I had a sleep study done and they said I had, uh, what do they call that? When you, you, you stop breathing in the middle of your sleep, Body. sleep apnea. Same here. You sleep apnea. Yeah. And, uh, I, I talked to my, I, then I went and got a, a checkup with my nose doctor and he's like, Hey, if you do this, this might help. And, and you won't get a CPAP machine. That's all I need is, is I've been married 18 years. And it's like, <laughs> okay, if I put this thing on at night, I know I'm not getting any. So that might end it. <laughs> That might end yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Say, that's Tom Dark Cruise. Vader at night. <laughs> How many times did you break your nose cast? Uh, multiple. There was, there was one bad one by, by Andrew Ladd in, in 2009 that shattered my nose. And um, it, was, it was bad. And I remember we were in, uh, we were in Chicago and, and it was playoffs, I believe. And their doctors look at me and they're like, oh, yeah, you're fine. Meanwhile, my nose is like a Z and I can't breathe out of either nostril. They forgot, like I had a cut in the bottom of my lip that I could put my tongue all the way down to like my bottom of my chin. Oh, and they're like, yeah, yeah, you're fine. And I'm like, well, what about this hole? Is this normal? And they're like, oh, <laughs> we should probably stitch that up. I'm like, yeah, you probably should. <laughs> <laughs> Just put some deep, put some deep cold on it. <laughs> that was in the heyday of those rivalries the blackhawks canucks where the trainer oh, yeah. i mean the, the doctor of the blackhawks women like with your bones sticking on you're like no you're good dude you're good go back out there <laughs> nothing a little duct tape can't fix oh yeah duct tape that's like the plane my first year i think we flew a, a company called sky king i think half the plane was put together by duct tape we flew sky king Oh, Sky King was the worst. <laughs> Sky Dump, we called it. Yeah, Sky Dump. <laughs> wow, you guys had Sky King? Oh, we had my first year. We had Sky King, and and uh, the plane, like the overhead compartments, were duct taped together. And their shit falling, <laughs> falling off, and I'm like, oh, is this safe to fly? I think we <laughs> we fell four thousand feet in the air one time, and I'm like, oh, okay, like I'm not okay with flying anymore. No, this is not good. I mean, you, hey, you were a maniac when you played, though. Like, fuck, like, I, I'm read. I, I was pulling up some of your old tweets. This is August 5th, 2018. Ryan Johansson, how's the summer training going? Want to meet <laughs> me in the streets before we <laughs> we get going on the ice? Like, what the fuck was that about? Like, August, uh, enjoy your summer, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think you guys both know how I played. Um, <laughs> I, it's, it's. It's not like it is nowadays where uh, everybody knows everybody and their buddies and, and they go and talk after the game. Like I enjoy being hated and I wanted to be hated because I had to play that way. Like I had, uh, like, that's the only way I knew how to play. And uh, um, I don't, I really don't know what the fuck I was thinking there. Like it's, it's August 7th. I'm but something probably made someone, one of my buddies probably said something to me and I'm like, <laughs> Oh yeah. Like that Joe, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go at him right now. And he's probably like, Oh, <laughs> Johansson's tougher than you. And I just start firing off tweets. <laughs> Biz, what time is the tweet at August? Oh yeah. Yeah. Let's check the time on this bad boy. Because it could have been, oh, been the afternoon drinks. Okay, okay four thirty. You probably had a nice buzz on, nice glow. Oh yeah, oh, my. just That's... got off the course. 
<laughs> um, d- did you like, w- were you like that when you were playing uh, at, like in your younger days or as your career progressed, did you have to like, kind of like almost self-motivate yourself to, to keep this mask on of being hated? Cause it's probably not fun. Like genuinely being hated. Uh, he says <laughs> it's I, a hard mask like to wear, man. It ain't so, fucking easy. So I got, I got cut one of my, the year before my U S national team when I made the U S national team, I got cut from, or two years before I got cut from every single team and, you know, talking with my brother later on, he's like, man, you, you were soft. You were. And then all of a sudden you got cut from all these teams and you had had like a fuck you to you that just came out of nowhere and you were going to make everybody pay. And ever since you got cut from everybody, you played with like this edge that I've never seen you play with before. So I think it started there. And then it just evolved and, you know, getting into the league, you know, first round draft pick, but still like Vancouver media isn't all that, that nice when, when you're not putting up points or, or you're a first round pick and maybe they didn't want you. So I, yeah, you know, I know Canadian media had me touted as like a third, fourth line guy and that's where the coaches had me too. So I had to get into this, uh, you know, I, th- I think I played the fourth line my first year. Um, I, d- I didn't crack the third line. So you're playing, I think my first two line mates were uh, Darren Langdon and either Brad May or Mike Keen. I think those were Mayday. my rotating Mayday and Keener. So, <laughs> you know, they'd scrum it up. So I'd scrum it up too. I had, and I acted bigger than what I was and I just continued. And um, it really just evolved into just, being a dick on the ice <laughs> my first or second year I, I faced off against mark messier oh and every single draw i won he would slash me he would cross check me he would put me in a headlock and he wouldn't get called and then you know looking back on it, i think that's who i learned from so like every single time i went against a crosby or mcdavid or someone I was slashing him. I was cross check. I, I would do anything I could do him off a draw because it's considered a battle and that's allowed. And, you know, that's like, I, I teach kids now. <laughs> that's how I'm teaching kids to take face offs. Like if you lose the draw, you make them pay. And, um, you know, it worked for me and I hope I, uh, hope i get the next generation of rats to, to continue it hey timmy see when you lose a draw <laughs> see these cages they got on the butt end will be the only thing that fits through that cage so you choke down Shave on your stick down. and you Shave fucking get him in the eye timmy <laughs> you fucking see like, all these teenage hockey players with eye patches on for fuck's sakes it must be weird though because you're coaching your son like real good player and you're seeing at this level where now it's so competitive and they are buddy buddies, right? Like you kind of have to teach kids more than you'd have to teach our age. And certainly before us, like once the game starts, as Kadri said to uh, the the avalanche, like I I cut no deals. I have no friends out there. So I'm I'm assuming you're like teaching that now, right? Yeah. um, It's, it's, it's our Quebec here this year. So um, (laughs) it's, uh, it's, I mean, I think we all remember Quebec, right? Um, it's, it's a big deal and this could make a team that met you guys you guys it. could kind of branch off in your own conversations all right what's up <laughs> no but but it is true like we we played uh we played a team the other day where i walk into the arena i walk by my best player and he's he's shooting the shit with some kid on the other team that he doesn't even know and i said hey no friends walk away <laughs> and that's honestly what i'm trying to Right, right now we're one of the top teams. I think we're number two. With, like they rank these teams for whatever reason, like for Instagram or whatever. We're number two in the country, which we have a target on our back. And I'm just trying to get these kids to realize, like, it doesn't matter how other teams play. It's it's about us and how we play. And and to get that through a 12 year old's head is is frustrating because they're good, bad, good, bad, and you know, just trying to develop kids um you got to be a psychologist with some of them but uh, um they're 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 all good kids they have good i actually have a team full full of good parents which isn't really that uh common no not that common at all um 
And that, that, that actually weighs a lot on if you make my team or not, you have to be a good family and because I'm not going to deal with the shit at all. So just trying to pay it forward to the next generation. And, and, uh, that's what I'm really doing with my life right now. What was the punishment for the kid who was, uh, talking to the other player? Did you waterboard him? <laughs> no, that's frowned upon. Actually. I've take, only done that once. He had to take face offs <laughs> against Kess for three straight days. <laughs> Oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. All right. I just wanted to know what, uh, oh, that's all right. Cass, Johnny you, had to go through. You played for your dad when you were a kid before you went pro, correct? Uh, I played, uh, yeah. For a couple of years I played for him. So we were able to pick up some, some lessons from back then that you can apply now with your kid on your team. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'd love for you to ask my son this, but I try not to be as hard on, uh, my son, but you know, if, if I can't treat him, the way I treat the other kids, then there's no favoritism with, with my son. Um, he has to earn everything plus some to even get ice time. Um, he's probably one of the only kids I sit on the team. So, so if he says how good a coach I am, and um, I don't know what his answer would be. Um, saying that, you know, one of the only reasons that, that I do coach is well, one, because of my son, but too is is like i said i want to pay it forward i want to pay it forward to this generation and i want to i want to instill some of the things that i've learned along the ways and you you look um there's not a lot of of good coaches at this age group or or in michigan right now so i just try to uh try to extend my knowledge Uh, going back to when you were younger i I always wondered uh, you were part of the best draft of all time, business draft. And it was weird, though, because not many that's guys. That's how they refer to, to it, too, actually. Uh, not many guys. That's how Bob McKenzie. The biz, refer- the biz, biz draft. draft. The biz draft. Yeah. <laughs> not many guys actually went to Ohio State from the national program. I know Umberger did, and then you followed him. But where else were you looking? Because I was always confused by that pick, being a Michigan kid. I didn't know how that went down. Oh, yeah. Um, Just one question. quick year there. <laughs> yeah, one one quick year. I they offered him a bigger. No, I, I don't want to tout myself too highly, but I I did have a lot of schools to choose from. Um, oh shit, you did. It, it was like twenty. Like every kid at the U.S. national team has a lot of of uh, teams to pick from, and really it came down to five teams. It was Wisconsin, Colorado College because my dad went there, um, Miami of Ohio, Ohio State. And I want to say Michigan State. Yeah, Michigan State. Michigan wasn't even in the in in the uh, um in the five because they sent me a fucking letter, like a letter in the mail. They didn't call me. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't even like seem like they wanted me. They said, "Hey, you got a full ride if you want it." And that turned me off so much. Oh, I. The reason why I went to Ohio State is they showed up at my doorstep at six a.m on the first day you can actually like go and visit a kid. And then they came back the next day at 6am and they woke me up both days and they cooked your Casey, breakfast. Oh yeah. Casey Jones did a great job. He was the assistant coach at the time. And, and I really liked both coaches and, you know, I remember sitting there and trying to, trying to pick Wisconsin. I, I went on a visit with Wisconsin and I went to Miami, Ohio and really just, I was like, who's, who's going to, who wants me the most and who's going to put me in the best situation to succeed. And at the time, I think Michigan state was a very defensive, I think, uh, well, Jeff Jackson, I think coached there at the time. No, not Jeff Jackson. No, it was, uh, um, what was that? Ron was a very, very defensive coach that coached there back then. And I'm like, well, I don't need that. Um, so I, I chose Ohio state just based on the fact that they really showed that they wanted me. Like, what are these conversations? Like, it seems like you, like you were like uh, more mature for your age. If you were considering all these variables or did you have somebody you were like vetting it with you? Like, were you leaning on your brother and your father? Cause I believe you said it was your brother who said he's never played, seen you play that mean. Is that what you said earlier? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. My, my brother and my dad, they, they actually allowed me. I asked for help. I'm like, guys, what do I do here? And they're like, uh, you're on your own on this one. You just pick who you who you want to play for. And I was like, and I sat and I it took a few weeks to even make a decision. And then I uh I finally chose Ohio State and it ended up being being the right choice, you know, getting drafted from Vancouver. And uh 
RJ Umberger was from the same team. He was a junior when I was a freshman. And uh, RJ and I got into it the first captain practice, which stirred some stirred some bad blood for whatever reason. And and uh, you know, I think that transpired into the pros when I fought him. I think that was part of the reason we fought. But um, going going back to that, I just, I, I wanted to be put in a situation where, where they trusted me and they, they really wanted me and they put me in a place to succeed. But when I got drafted, Vancouver was like, okay, you're not going back to that team. We're going to sign you. And I oh, think, shit, I, I, really, I, yeah, yeah like right away. Left. They're like, Hey, you know, we've seen RJ the way he's transpired over the last three years. And, uh, we, we want to sign you right now like right away. And he's, they're like, you'll probably start off in the minors, but you'll make your way. And looking back on it, that's probably what helped me the most was signing right away out of college. Like after year one, looking at it, I got a taste of the NHL. I played like 27 games. Then it was the, the full lockout year. So I got to play in the minors with a f- really good uh, AHL, like some really good players, really good league back then. And then that, that transpired into year three where I made the team full time. And I, I never looked back from there. Yes. I think that that's why that draft was so special because that lockout happened and all those guys got to go dominate the American league. Like you can go through the full list. I want to say Richards and Carter were with the Philly Phantoms and they won it. So for that example, you just use like you guys got to play with like NHL caliber players and guys who were like true pros where nowadays these guys are developing with other guys who are in diapers. Like it's like, there's like a veteran rule too. You can only have like three vets now. It's fucking crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. It's so it's so true. Um, that's, that's part of the problem. Like you call it silver spoon, right? Uh, guys that never played in the minors. Um, it takes, there's something to be said that to, to to drive hours upon hours and play three and three, three games and three nights and, and have that third game be at noon in Hamilton. And, <laughs> and, and, ha- and then all of a sudden you got guys teeing off on each other at 1201 and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, just, just to have that experience of carrying your own bag and, and, and getting off the bus and, and understanding and working your way up to, to the NHL where you really appreciate, how, how the NHL players are treated. I, I forgot that you, because back then it was, you were drafted. Um, the college guys, they, it delayed it a year. So you got drafted and boom, right to, right to pro. That wasn't that common then. But I remember going and playing the moose that lockout year where the AHL was phenomenal. I remember it was you. That was the first time I played against Bieksa and Burroughs. And that was like three guys who had a lot to do with all the success Vancouver had. So I'm guessing you guys getting to know each other that year had a big, big thing to do with that. But my question being, it's long winded. You and BX alpha males, there must have been some at least battles in practice early when you two met. Uh, Where do I start? By the way, you're saying his name. You you are butchering. His oh, I know name what right the now. fuck dude, was that, dude? dude it's it's literally Fucking it's like Don my Cherry. Twitch. I have a million of them. <laughs> I can't say his name because they told me it's not BX Ska. I don't even Bieksa. fucking know. <laughs> He's gonna punch my head, and even if I got it right, so who cares? Uh, no, there there's so many times. It, he's like my big brother. Honestly, we uh, we battle all the time we battle and then we come back and we're friends and then we battle again. It's, it's like we're best buddies and we still battle to this day. So, you know, one story I could bring up is, <laughs> is uh pregame skate. So I stay out there. It's me and Burroughs and Rick bonus is out there and BX is at the other end. And we're just, we're, you know, I, I'm working on my shot and then all of a sudden a puck whizzes by me. And I'm like, I look down to the other end and I see Bieksa just, just laughing, like shoulders bobbing, like I keep shooting. Another one whizzes by. So, so now we're, now I turn around and we're taking full slap shots at each other and we're trying to hurt each other. Like, and we're pissed off now. And so we're at center ice and, and Rick bonus. I don't know if you guys know bones at all, but he is, he's a great human being. And he, he, he's one of my favorite coaches. He had to get in between us in pregame skate (laughs) and, and we get off the ice and, and it's just all the stupid pranks we used to play at each on each other where it's, you know, the, the, 
the tape or the or the uh, toilet paper and the gloves or the shaving cream and the gloves or cutting each other's laces, all the, all the shit that we used to we used to do to each other. And I would probably be the sensitive one where I'd be like, okay, like, this isn't cool. Like, why'd you guys do this? I'm trying to get ready for a game, like trying to be serious and juice and burls would be in the corner laughing, making fun of me. And I, I'd get poopy pants and (laughs) that's how it would go. Exactly. I want to ask who put that lobster on the pillow in Columbus. Oh, you heard about that. eh? What? I I did. You must have snapped. (laughs) So, so, oh, so me and BX, we were roommates for like seven years and we're roommates. We're in Columbus and we're staying at that uh, Sheridan. I think it is at, at the Easton mall. And we go across the street, we go to a bar, they got like a live band going and we're sitting in the corner and we see this like vending machine that has live lobsters. And you got to like get the claw and you got to go down and you got to catch a lobster. So the boys were trying to do it all night and, we're having beers and, you know, we get back to the hotel and guys are riding like the security uh, segways around the, around the halls. And it's just like a complete shit show. And so I, so I go to bed and I'm laying in bed for, and juice is already in bed and I'm, I'm laying in bed and I put my hands, I like roll over and I put my hands underneath my pillow and I just feel like the, the lobster tail. And immediately my head goes to that vending machine. And then I'm like, shit, I'm going to lose a finger. So I pick it up and I throw, throw it. It goes against the wall and I go back to bed. Well, the next day, BX wakes up, sees it. Obviously he was in on it. Um, and then I saw the video on who, who did it. I don't know. Well, I do know who did it, but I don't know why you would wear a red shirt and say like, oh, no, it wasn't me. Like, I saw you all day in a red shirt. Like, I don't need to see your face. It was you. And it was uh, it was a rookie. And he, did he get it after that? It was Cody Hodson. No oh, shit. Oh, you got him traded to Buffalo? <laughs> got him out of the league. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got him. No, I think he got himself out of the league. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my! Hey, uh, no. The, first of all, it's an un- any any other BX short stories you want to tell? But I was just going to ask you a hockey question, quick. Uh, there's so many of them. We can just go on for days. This guy, this guy does handstands wherever he can. Honestly, like he'll just he'll be in a full suit doing a headstand in the middle of the lobby for no reason. Just loves it. Like, sure. How off. long can he hold it? As long as he wants. No. Yeah. He's like a Jedi fucking black belt or something. Isn't I, he? I woke up and like, we had like maybe 12, we went to Italy together and we had like 12 bottles of wine together. Like next morning he's up at 8 AM. I look down and there's like a pool at the bottom of the hill and I'm looking down. This guy's like standing on his head and I'm just watching. He has no idea. I'm watching him. He's just doing a headstand for no reason. Like, seven eight in the morning after drinking 12 bottles of wine doing a headstand that's probably the last thing i would want to do at seven eight in the morning after having 12 bottles of wine <laughs> i can't even normal stand after nights like that <laughs> uh was he a freak in the gym is any was he one of the guys that would would push you in that dynamic uh yeah he 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 was a guy that always worked right he 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 was a guy that you know, he, he signed, you guys know the Fetter, Fetteroff story. <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys heard about that, but he, he made it from, from playing in the HL, you know, same with Burroughs. He went from the coast to the HL, but like juice went to the HL to the NHL. And he honestly worked his way up and, and, you know, that, that group, that core group of guys that we had from Manitoba, they, they really drove that team, I think. And, um, he was a guy that, that always cared about his body. He always wanted to look good. So when he started getting older, he started getting some love handles and I started, started, uh, you know, ribbing him a bit like, Oh, juice, you getting some love. No, no, I know. He's like, Hey, it's just cause I'm old. I can't get rid of these. <laughs> so later on, he's like, Hey, you know, you really affected me when you started calling out, gotcha. me out on my love, love handles. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. I'm like, what? He's like, then I learned if you actually work out your obliques, they actually get bigger rather than smaller. And I'm like, oh, good to know. I'm like, now that I'm 38, I I know 
why he has love handles. They're, they're impossible to get rid of. <laughs> I'm going to get surgery for mine, I think. I'm just waiting um, for an ad. I'm just waiting for we could do an ad so I get it for free. So we, we have new listeners. You referred to the Fedorov story. Were you there for it? And can you go back and tell it if so? Uh, no, I wasn't there for it. Okay. I, I know I know word for word, though. Let's um, look, we have new listeners and I like hearing it. it it's, uh, a, it's a wild story because at the time he was just on an AHL deal, right? No, he was on like a 10 day tryout. Yeah, it was like oh, a PTO. Shit. Yeah, okay. it was a PTO in the middle of the year. I was up in Vancouver and we had the same agent. So like he he's playing with the straw at Earl's Polo Park. Um, and he's playing with the straw and the straw flicks up. His story is the straw flicks up and hits uh Kirill Koltsov who was a Russian demon I believe and Kirill and Fetter were were tight so Fetter comes over he's like let's go we're going outside we're gonna fight so like he, they start beaking back and forth and and I guess it got pretty heated and he went and sat down with Fetter's billet at a table so Fetter had a billet dad in in the pros and Kevin was sitting down with his billet dad and he's like, Kevin, don't go outside. He's like, no, I think I'm going to go outside. So he goes outside and he, he, he goes outside and, and Fetter. It, meanwhile, it's like November in Winnipeg and it's not warm. Fetter has a shirt off. He's jumping around like Kirill's out there. He's doing leg swings, leg kicks. So he, he goes and he, he starts punching and, and I think Fetter caught him with one. And Kirill does like this spinning leg kick out at him where he's like trying to defend, fend off his leg, like his, his spinning leg kicks. And he caught Fetter with one and dropped him. And then that was it. He cut him for some stitches and um, Berkey called him the next day. And he's like, Hey, you know what? You, you're signed like hundred percent. You're signed. And then I guess Stan Smeal called him in the office the next day. And he's like, Hey, and Kevin's like, obviously super nervous. You're on a 10 day trial. Like you have no idea what's going on. And he's like, I just want to know how hard did you hit him? And he's like, I got him pretty good. He's like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay awesome. That is yeah, uh, unreal. Unreal that's story. A, that's, a, that's a great signing story. And made a um, career out of it. Right. The, the hockey question I was going to ask you, you talked about learning that lesson from Mark Messi early on, where you make your opponents pay off the face off because it's considered a battle. Like what, what helped you make the offensive jump? Maybe other than ice time, like, you know, you had the Sedins when you were there, like who, who were the guys who really had an impact in advancing your offensive side of your game? Um, to be honest, you know, I, I really think when we signed Matt Sundin and Pavel Dimitra, um, those were two guys that I actually played on a line with, um, I was actually, they were trying to convince me to shave my head because they were both bald, right? And they were trying to get me to pick my head. And I'm like, there's zero chance I'm doing this at all. So just playing with those two guys, two veteran guys. And and I don't know if you guys remember when, when Matt signed with us, it was kind of like, it, it, it was like right before Christmas, I want to say like early December. And our first game was in Edmonton. And this guy had pants. He looked like he was six feet wide. His ass looked like he was six feet wide when he went out there. And he was out of shape, obviously. He didn't skate at all. And I think when he came on, we didn't win a game for like seven games. Like seven straight games we lost. And I want to... I want to say, I'm not going to say he's, he was out there for every single goal, but like there were some games where he would take a penalty late in the, late in the game and they'd score and they'd go up and they we'd lose. So it was a must win game against Carolina. And same thing. We uh, were down four, three and Matt's takes a penalty. And this is like to lose game eight. And Alex Burroughs goes down and scores shorthanded to tie the game. And this is with like a minute left in the game. Then we win in overtime. We break the streak. Um, something like that. It might've been an overtime where he took the penalty, but that's, that's really how that went about. But I kind of got off subject, but Matt's taught me so much about how, how to protect the puck. Cause he was so good at protecting the puck. And then Pablo just, you know, 
unfortunately he's not with us anymore, but he taught, taught me so much about just the little details, the little skill plays, the little putting pucks in the areas. And to be honest, I loved playing with him because he didn't give a shit. Like he used to call Elaine Vigneault Tikhanov and and taking off would sit him and he'd just be like, ah, fucking taking off. <laughs> and then he starts swearing and 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 Shaq or <laughs> or Slovak. And uh I, I would just I would just start laughing. And, and just those two guys, they just gave me the confidence. And and when you play with two like Hall of Famers like that, it just brings your confidence up. And really all the attention goes to them and you're left wide open. And then once you start getting success in the NHL, it, you know, it kind of blossoms from there. What was Matt's like when, when uh, that streak was going on? Was he like chirping himself? Like, was he pretty tight lipped guy? Was he very quiet? He was very quiet. He was a guy that, you know, even off the ice, I learned, learned a lot from, he was always the first one at the rink. I'd go in the gym. He would be on the bike, looked like he was there for hours, just grinding it out on the bike every day, just trying to get in shape. Right. And he did that the whole time he was there because, um, he only played that like half a year with us. And then he had that, he had an extra, I think it was 10 million bucks for another year. And he just said, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I'm done. So he, he honestly was just a quiet guy that really, I don't want to say kept to himself, but he was just a quiet leader. He he, he led by example and, and that's the way he was, but he did have an epic night in um, Toronto when he wanted one in the shootout. That was a, that was a fun night. Did you guys go to music and he paid yeah. the whole thing? With the and K. There was probably 7,000 chicks around your guys' tables. <laughs> it was a fun night. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cash, your first coach was Mark Crawford. Then you had Vigneault after him. How was your relationship with each guy your first couple of years? Crow was super hard on me. Um, I got the, uh, let's just say the Sedines put it, thank you for coming. And I'm like, why? And they're like, oh, because you're the whipping boy now. And I'm like, oh, okay. And yeah, I, he was hard on me. But as hard as Crow was on me, he he really taught me that, you know, young guys can't make mistakes. And if you're going to make it in this league, you got to make it in the league with defense first. And that's what he really, really hammered home with me. Did that do a lot for my offensive game? No. Um, because I was almost scared to make plays out there, but that's the way it was back then. Um, you know, you look at, uh, young guys now, you know, when I watch games, they, they, they make a lot of mistakes and they're, they're allowed to get away with it. If I, if I made one mistake, my ass was stapled to the bench and I wasn't getting off for the rest of the game. Like I was just sat for the rest of the game. And I remember this one, uh, one, my in Chicago was way back in the day, my first year. So like 2004 and um, Chicago stadium was not packed at all. It was like maybe six, 7,000 fans. And when I got my parents tickets, they all sat right behind the bench. So it's like us coaches, my parents, like right by the tunnel, right behind our bench. So I got like my whole family, it's like 20 people where they got the whole first row behind the bench. First shift, I, I come over the blue line and make a pass, a drop pass to Tyler Bouk, who was on my line at the time. And he takes a shot on that. You know, good play. I'm like, oh, great drop pass. Got a shot covered. End zone face off. Oh, let's take Kessler's line out. Let's put Naslin's out there. And I come to the bench and he comes down and he's like, if you ever make a fucking drop pass in this league again, you will never play another game in the fucking <laughs> NHL. And I'm like, and I no look at my pass parent, rule. <laughs> yeah, no drop pass rule. So I look and my, I, I like, I would tell my parents stories like this and they, they'd be like, no way. He's such a nice guy. And I'm, and then they heard <laughs> it for the first time. They're like, their, their face was just like white jaws dropped. And I'm like, yeah, this is what I deal with. But, you know, it was with how, how hard he was on me, he did instill a lot of good habits with me. He, he was a guy that he, he was a really good ex. He was probably my best bench coach I've ever had, but like X's and O's, he had Mike Johnston, who, who, who I think is a really good assistant coach at that level. Um, but with Vigneault now go to Vigneault and he, he was a guy that allowed me to spread my wings. Um, we didn't have the best start to our relationship with me signing that offer sheet. And I was supposed to have a meeting with them that morning where, uh, 
he, uh, I grabbed my equipment. I said I had to go to a charity event, but I knew I was about to sign an offer sheet and Vigneault wanted to meet with me the next morning. So I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll see you the next morning, knowing I'm not going to see him the next morning because I'm going to sign the offer sheet with Philly. So I signed the offer sheet and I drive down to Seattle and they make me wait on it for like six days. I'm, I'm practicing with the WHL team there. Yeah. They had a week, right? They had a week week. to match it. Yeah. And they made me wait, wait six days. So I come back and I think training camp was in Vernon, British Columbia. And of course they make me test. I missed the first day of testing. They make me test the first day at camp. So I skate all day. Then they make me test after. Well, after the skate, Vigneault grabs me and everybody else is off the ice. I'm like, oh, I'm a young guy. I'm like, oh, this is going to be fun. And he grabs me, he grabs my jersey and he goes, if you ever fucking lie to me again, I will put you into the fucking sixth row. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, get the <laughs> fuck out of my face. <laughs> Come on. What was this offer sheet they, for? It was it was one year deal, right? For one point yeah. nine. Yeah, they were offering me uh, eight hundred, and I just wanted a million bucks, like two hundred more grand. And Philly came in out of nowhere and signed me for one year, one point nine. And Vancouver was strapped at the cap, I think, and they decided at the last second to keep me. I guess. It's wow. crazy looking back, like the player of your caliber, like they were thinking about 1.9. Imagine what, that. Maybe, maybe <laughs> they would. And what's interesting, I wonder if it ever came up. I had to ask, but when you got picked by Vancouver, Philly was up next. They took Mike Richards. Did they ever say, like, I'm guessing if he's if they're signing you to offer sheets, they probably were pissed when Van took you that draft. Yeah, they were thinking, uh, you know, just talking to to the well, I think I talked through my agent, but um they're really excited to have Richards, Carter, me. And they're like, we're going to be set up for the next few years down the middle. Like they were thinking, okay, we got to play against Ovechkin. We got to play against Crosby. We got to play against Yarmir Yager at, with the Rangers. It's like, we have a centerman that can match up against them and we'll allow Richards and Carter to do their thing. So that was their, uh, their mindset, which was a good mindset. It just didn't work out for 1.9. They, they might have a yeah, cop, right? Hey, Which they if they didn't match it, they would have got a second round pick back then. I think that's oh why it was one point nine. Yeah, second this round is crazy. Pick. Now, Cass, were you doing it to tell Vancouver shit to get off the pot, or were you genuinely looking for a change of scenery? No he wanted I, money. You know, he just wanted money, a million bucks. Nine, he fucking, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you look at it. Um, one point one more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One point one more, and I actually bought a boat that summer that was orange, black, and white, and I named it nice. Offer Sheet. It had offer sheet on the back. <laughs> oh my uh, god! I don't oh, know where they didn't going. hate you before Bobby they hate you now. Floating around in Michigan <laughs> with offer sheet on the back. That's Philadelphia Flyers colors. <laughs> that is too fucking good. That was the only way I could afford the boat back then. The one point one million. Why do you think right. there's still such an unwritten code about these offer sheets? They're, they're legal. They're by the book, and but GMs don't want to do them to each other. Why do you think it's still the way? Uh, well, I, I think it's. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want it done to me if I was a GM. I, I mean, you kind of blackball yourself if you're a GM and you do that, right? Um, yeah, I think when people do it, it's, it's either they really want the player and they really need to do something drastic to help their team or, or they hate the GM, one or the other, right? Like... I think it's it's a it's a league where all the GMs have to get along and know each other and and if you're gonna ever make deals with people because think about it you screw over a GM that's well liked in the league you think you're gonna make trades with any anybody else that's buddies with that guy no so I think that's the biggest reason why those offer sheets you don't see many of them a little bit of a fuck you match going between who is it Carolina Montreal yeah <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> So, you, so you're basically like, like, that, like, is it well known that those guys hate each other? They have to, right? A hundred percent. They have oh, to. Yeah. Oh, so we did it to St. Louis, right? Where they didn't, they give us an offer sheet and then we had to match and then we gave back as an offer sheet. And then they, yeah, it, it, ha- it happens all the time. 
That's I don't know sure. why. I love yeah. it. I, I I hope the NHL turns into more like a NBA style like that with the pettiness. <laughs> gives us more to talk about, right? All right, I'll throw it over to you. I think you had one going. Yeah, I, I was wondering when you did end up signing back with Vancouver, was there any animosity from management or front office? Did things start to go sideways then, or was it you know all water under the bridge when you went back? Uh, no, it wasn't water under the bridge. Uh, we had a good veteran group, which helped me during the time. Uh, we had like Naslin, Morrison, Bertuzzi, Trevor Linden, and they 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 could tell like you know. <sighs> I was, I was nervous and they're like, what's going on, Cass? He's like, well, Dave Nonis, who was the GM at the time, he's like, he just told me I once have a meeting with me at like seven o'clock at night in his room. And I'm like, Panic. I'm back. Like, what does he want? Like, I know what he wants to talk about. And they're like, well, just go in there and just don't say anything. Just listen and then leave. So I go in, I knock on the door, I knock on Nonis's door and Steve Tambellini, who's the assistant GM, he, he answers the door and he's like, hey, come sit down. I look in the room and the blinds are just cracked a little bit, right? And lights coming in, a little bit of light. And he has like this big bed and he's like a chair sitting across from another chair. And Dave Nonis is putting like his hands in his head, shaking his head like, he can't believe I did it. So I go in, he's like, have a seat. So Steve sits on the, the, the corner bathtub of the room. They're like, you know, when the, the jacuzzi's in the corner of the room, he's sitting on the jacuzzi in the corner of the room. And he just looks up and he just gave it to me for like 45 minutes about <laughs> how, how I fucked over the team and this and that, which whatever, like, did I, did I fuck over the team? I mean, maybe for, for the amount, but at the end of the day, looking back, he asked me if I'd ever do it again. And I said, no, but you know, thinking back on it, they had an opportunity to, to sign me for a million bucks and they didn't. And, you know, I think they overplayed their hand and looking back on it, I think Noni would want to sign me for a million, million bucks rather than let me go to an offer sheet. So I come out and, 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 you know, obviously like the, the guy, he, he, he made me tear up. And like, I was like, did I fuck the team over? And I talked and I remember going to Morrison's room and he had like five guys in there and they like talked me off the ledge. So like, you didn't fuck over the team. Like that's, that's why veterans are so huge um, on a team. And I, you know, it's, it's sad to see the NHL getting away from those older guys um, because they, you know, they might not be, you know, your star players, but they do have a role in the room and they, they have a role for the, those young guys. Did you have a certain trick to uh, a, a certain way of telling the Sedins apart? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, it took me probably a year, but I finally realized that Hank has a bigger head <laughs> and it's that um, simple. <laughs> yeah. But like, honestly, after like two, three years, they look like two completely different person, people. Like, like I honestly, if I look at them today, I, I know Danny, I know Hank. They do not do not look the same to me at all. No and that's shit. just playing with them for 11 years. Day in and day out, seeing their mugs, you finally yeah. figured it out. Yeah, every day. Those guys were just so fun to watch. Like, I... I don't understand like playing playing against them. It's one thing and watching as a fan, one thing, but the stuff you must have seen in practice is what kills me because there must've been different things. They didn't even attempt or, or even pull off in games that you witnessed daily, just practicing with those guys. Yeah. It's it, they, for what, like, I know why, but they have a sixth sense on where each other are. It was, it was, they wouldn't even look, they wouldn't talk. It would just be like spin a ram up, backhand pass sauce through the ice right on the table and you'd be like okay and they were the most competitive people in practice and they just worked um they really drove the bus when it came to being in shape they they killed every test they came in at the top of every single score for testing during training camp and the stuff that obviously playing against them is hard but just the stuff I would see day in and day out is something that you don't see ever. Um, you see individual skill, but looking at them, uh, 
you know, they didn't have the best shot. They didn't have, you know, the best stick handling skills. They, they, what set them apart was their mind. They thought the game so well and their compete was so well, and they didn't back down from anybody and their passing and their smarts. They just, they made it work and they they're going to the hall of fame for a reason because they're, you know, I don't, I consider them generational type players. Yeah. And the, and the thing is they took a lot of heat early on. I mean, probably before you were there, but I'm sure you heard about it. The Sedin sisters, all that stuff. It's like, they had to be mentally tough because it wasn't the, the case of nowadays where stuff was handed to them at all. No, no, especially with, with Crow as their coach, they expected to play a certain way. And, you know, talking to him, I know Danny got sad a couple of times in the stands and, said he wasn't playing hard enough and this and that. And, and they take abuse. Like they used to take abuse from the other team. They, I, I, I think because watching a day in day out teams would just be like, we got to play them hard. We got to hit them. We got to cross check them. We just got to get them. And they would never get off their game ever. They would just go back and take more punishment. They would do their plays and they would, you know, they'd win a lot of games for us single-handedly. I'm um, guessing, um, the hall of fame should be, are you going to be there when, when they're, when they're inducted coming up? Should yeah. Be pretty fun. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Um, when you guys made your run to the cup, you guys played Nashville in what the second round. Second round. Yeah. So I asked a few buddies, like, just like, Hey, like you know, from watching Kessler all those years, like what was the one thing that, that stuck out? And they go, I've never seen a player dominate a series individually on like on, in hockey, the way that you did that, that series. So there was like three of them that said that. That was the first thing that stood out. Would you say that that's the best hockey you've ever played in your life and the most you, you felt on top Look, of your game? Looking back on it, yeah. Um, you know, I I would say that would that probably be by far the, the best hockey I've ever played. Um, day in, day out. It, it's it, for whatever reason, it just seemed like everything was going in every time I shot it go in. And then, you know, I feel like I was in Rennie's head a bit and, and, you know, I'd use that to my advantage. I'd chirp him and, um, you know, playing against Weber and, 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 um, who was I, I think Dude, Greg Wong, the, Suter, the, yeah. the clips are, it's a, there's a YouTube clip. I think it's called like beast mode for anyone who wants to see this, this, this series you had, it's unreal, but yeah, you walk through Suter and Weber a couple different times. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. It's like the pucks following you around, right? You, you try something that actually works. So um, I, I would say that was probably the best hockey I've ever played, but saying that like an idiot, I am play the best hockey. Oh, I need new skates. So I changed skates after the series, I'm like, oh, we got five games. I can't go two more series with these skates. So, of course, I change skates. And then five games later, I just blow my hip out. No, like I always like, you know, we're hockey players. We overthink things, right? I'm like, if I didn't change my skates, would I have blown my hip out? Probably. But like, you know, that's just the what ifs, right? Yeah, you just never know. It's, it's so you always wonder. So you did that in the series against who, the Blackhawks? No, the sharks the sharks. the i did it yeah I, I used new skates for the sharks and i just yeah you know was how that, new skates are was, was, that the, was that the start of your your hip issues or had you already been injured no before i that? yeah i've been injured before that i think that was my second surgery second or third and i think it's well documented and, and you you've been very open about it was that the time where you needed to start the tour at all or or was it before that and you know, you talk about maybe the, the health impacts later down the road. Like, you put your body through hell to, to go out there and compete, Cass. Gave it to the game. You gave it to the game. Yeah. You left it all out. Um, there, the first one was uh, my, what was that? My third year. So, I, I third year, which would be maybe 06, 07. We were playing Dallas in the first round. And I was just coming back. I played the first game, and it went seven periods, and I broke my finger. And that's kind of when it started, the tour all use. And then after I learned I broke my finger and it needed surgery, I just told him to cut it off. And literally, I argued with the doctor for like two <laughs> hours at like two in the morning. I'm like, no, I'm not doing surgery. You're going to cut it off right here. Just put me out and cut it off. Like They're like, no, we're not going to do that. I'm like, do I need this pointer finger? No, it's my left hand. Who needs a pointer finger on their left hand? 
So this went back and forth. Like, Did you feel like hour. you were breaking them at some point? Oh, or yeah. You... I, I was like, and, and then I'm like, oh, all right, whatever. And I stormed out of there. <laughs> the doctor's but, like, I might fucking cut this guy's finger off. Right now. <laughs> get him out of my office. Yeah. You like refuse to leave his room. Yes. So no, that you guys know how it is. It's, it's playoff time. It's you play injured. Um, you know, that's, that's the way I was growing up is if you can go out there and and lace your skates up and, and, you know, give 70, 80%. My thought is my 70 or percent is better than the last guy's 70 or a hundred percent. And that's just the way I thought, like, if I can help the team and I can be out there and, and even just going on the ice and and giving them 80%, a hundred percent of my 80% is, is better than, than changing up the lineup. So, you know, was I stubborn on, on that? Did, did, did I take a lot of tour at all? Did I take a lot of painkillers? Did I destroy my body? Absolutely. But I did it. I did it for the game and I did it for, for all those guys that were fighting alongside me. No regrets. No, no. Uh, do I do I wish I wouldn't have taken so many pills to to give myself Crohn's? Abs- absolutely, but um, um, you, you take the pills to be able to play, right? You you take the shots to be able to play. Um, it's something that I did. It's something that the team allowed me to do, and and I just uh, what I wish is I I wish I was better educated about it. That's that's really what I wished, so I could make an educated choice. And and to be honest, I wasn't. And and that's that's kind of what sucks about the whole thing, right? Um, saying that my hips are are trash, they're new, but um, you know, I can finally live a normal life again. So, did you get hip replacement, or yeah. is it a different so type surgery? Or so it's a it's called resurfacing. So it's uh, it's basically uh, oh, I got it right here. Hold on. Yeah, I think he, I think he posted a photo of like the ball that they put in. So this no. is it. So this is this oh, is yeah. what the doctor gave me. So this this thing is the <laughs> socket. This thing's the socket. This thing's the ball. That's my hip. Oh, wow. so this post goes into my hip, and this goes onto my ball, my socket. Holy shit! So and how pain, long and pain free right now? Pain free? Um, for the most part. For the most part, like. If I, if I walk for a while, I have to sit down like my, especially my left one, my left one's like a year and a half old, the muscles and the hip just starts to hurt. So I'll have to sit down. But other than that, like I can, I can play with my kids. I can do, I can golf. I can um, get on the ice and coach, but I, there's, I tried coming back with my, my first one and the other one went within like three months and I'm like, I'm not doing this. I haven't put, I haven't put on my gear and shit two and a half years. Did any doctors give you like a heads up, like long-term use or this could happen or side effects or they just give it to you and don't give you any warning whatsoever? No, there's no warning at all. Like the, um, and it's not that they're, they're bad doctors or anything like I, you know, I don't, I, I wouldn't blame them for giving it to me, I, you know, but I would like the NHL and the PA to be better at, you know, telling the guys the side effects. Like if I would have known like, Oh yeah, there's a possibility that this could destroy your gut. Don't take this money. Then yeah, I wouldn't take that money. I want to go back to Roberto Luongo. We haven't brought him much, him much lately. Would you guys trade from that day? Did that kind of goose the whole team given his stature in the game and how good he was? Yeah. Um, I was, I was at a Canucks charity event when it came across. And unfortunately one of my, like one of, one of the guys that took me under his wing Bertuzzi, he, uh, he was in the trade and, you know, obviously I was sad to see him go, but getting a goalie like Louie, it it changed our team. Um, we went from a team that, um, had the skill up front. We just, you know, goaltending wise, we needed that, that guy. And, getting him and and it's just seeing him day in day out like he is the most awkward guy ever when he he has like size 14 feet and he's doing like he has his routine he does before games like every probably goalie does and um he's a guy that 
he, he just looks like he's wearing clown shoes and, and, you know, him playing two touch before the games, it, it was just like, how can this guy be a good goalie? And then he goes in and he's world-class and, you know, we knew what we, and, and the thing is, is he didn't want a day off. He wanted to play every single game. We had to like, tell him, no, you're not playing every single game. You got to like, we're saving you for playoffs. And, you know, I think when we got Corey Schneider and, and those two emerged together, that's when Louis was like, okay, taking days off. And and those two together really helped propel our team. Outside of his play, like what else did he bring to the team in the locker room? I mean, we know on Twitter he's hilarious, but we haven't heard too much of him. And since he was captain for a while. Oh, yeah, he was a captain for a year. I remember that conversation. <laughs> um, <laughs> Vigneault called us all in. I think it was like Matias, Owen, the Sedins, me, and uh, someone else. And – um, he calls us all in and he's like, well, Louis our best player. So he's going to be captain. Even though the NHL won't recognize him as a captain, we're, he's still going to be our captain. <laughs> and we're like, wait, what? Okay. Whatever. What is going <laughs> our, on? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I, and then he couldn't get the C on the Jersey. So he had it on like, the oh yeah. Right on his flavor chin. saver. Yeah. <laughs> flavor saver C. What a beauty. Um, I had to go take a quick piss, but like, like, was he the leader of the team? You may have already answered that. Like, like he, he did, you know, it was tough. It, it was, it was a tough job. And I think that's why I only did it for one year. You don't have a pulse on the bench. You don't have really a pulse with what's going on in the game. His job was to stop the puck and he can't go up and talk to the referee. Um, so do I think it was a good, good choice? I, you know, I do think he was our best player, but I think there's a reason why goalies can't be named captain is because, you know, you know, they can't, they can't talk to the refs. They can't leave their crease. Um, and to be honest for us, it was tough because he would come in and say some stuff. Absolutely. Like try to lead by example or lead by, you know, being the rah, rah guy in the room. And he did a good job at it, but I think you need a player to be a captain. A hundred percent. Yeah. Like even you just saying it, like then he's got to come back TV timeouts and like, you don't want to, you don't want to feel like he thinks he has to say something where it's like, yo, you just got to stay in the zone and stop. Yeah. The puck, like you said stay in the zone. Also, w- words of encouragement from somebody on the bench, like understanding, you know, w- what's happening right now in the game and what needs to be said. Maybe the coach is fucking giving it to one of the guys and he says, Hey, enough, you know, like yeah. I mean, that shit happens. Exactly. And then, you know, I think, Louis realized that, and I think Louis was like, "Okay, I'm not doing this next year." He loved playing poker, didn't he? Was he a big poker player? He was a big online poker guy, and he was very mad when when that got taken away from him. He yeah, was a guy that uh, honestly played. I, I don't think his wife moved the one year, and it, he. I was, I was so I was sub penthouse with him. So he had one side, I had the other side. I, I honestly didn't see him the entire year. I yeah, I wouldn't want to take a black light to that that penthouse, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> uh, oh uh, my goodness. Cass, I know Halloween Halloween is right around the corner here. Uh, I heard you had a Sylvester costume a few years back that was a big hit. Want to share anything with us? <laughs> you guys talked to BXA, huh? <laughs> hey, I know nothing. <laughs> um yeah. So, so where was it? Oh, it was at uh, uh, West Oak Piers in Vancouver. And Shocker. I show up early, like the idiot I am. Um, and I'm in this full, like, mascot costume, head to toe Sylvester. Just, and I'm just sitting on, like, this high, like, perch outside. And I just, I don't say a word. I, I show up early. And I'm just sitting there. I don't move. And people are walking, like the team's walking by me, looking at me like, who's this guy? And like, no one, even like random, like people in in the streets are like, who the hell is this guy? And no one knows it's me. So everybody goes in. And finally, after like an hour of just fucking with people, I I go into the party and I get a straw. I never take my mask off. And it wasn't until the next day that uh, I, uh, I revealed who I was. Hey, uh, I had this written down. You fought Jerome McGinla. Was that one of the, your toughest competitors? Like, what was that like? Fighting uh, a legend? Jerome, Jerome fucking hated me, man. Oh, my. Oh, 
that guy preseason, he'd like, all right, we're doing this. Let's go. I go, buddy, wow. it's preseason. Relax. Stay away from me. Even I'm like, Hey, calm down. <laughs> like easy there. Captain selfish, like relax. <laughs> wow. Oh my God. You would say that to him. Would that just oh, get yeah. him fucking losing? You his know mind? what? The actual you talk a lot of shit. Oh, I talk so fuck. much shit. Like, wow, I remember oh, my God. oh yeah, like it, oh. it was a whole thing. They told me to shut up. They said, Don't talk to him, Cass. Like, you're just gonna rile him up and then he's gonna score three goals and then the game's gonna be over. <laughs> so, like, I wouldn't talk to him. Then as soon as he scores, of course, I can't help myself. Oh, you know, you scored a goal finally. Hey, uh, oh my God. you must be happy you're losing six <laughs> to one, but <laughs> <laughs> that was gutless. Oh. He, he uh He's probably, well, I know he's probably a guy I would love to play with. Like he plays with his heart on his sleeve. He, 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 he played, he played to win and he played to kill. Like, and the first fight I had against him, he could have absolutely demolished me with a, a flying haymaker. I thought the fight was over. I was just puffing wind and the refs come in and then they let off. And, and th this haymaker, I felt the wind go by my face. And I'm like, ah, oh, thank God that didn't hit me. <laughs> hey, I love how you're like, he could have, like in my head, I'm like, oh, he let up on him. No, he, he was no, trying to, he just missed. No, he, he missed. He missed. Yeah. Um. So he was a pretty classy guy in the media. Would he be vocal in the media about how much he hated you, hated you or would he keep it? Uh, would he keep no, it professional? No, he's not like Johansson. He, he kept it professional. Yeah. Fuck, he never <laughs> cracked. That's the one thing no. I respect the most about him. Mm -hmm. And he yeah. like there, I think I might be wrong here. I felt like there was like a couple times where like Calgary media was getting on him. I might be dead wrong here, but he always was like, he always kept it positive and so professional. Like it yeah, was he, fucking nuts. Yeah. Classy guy, right? Like he, oh. he's a guy that uh first class on the ice, first class off the ice. Like even, even when we got in our chirping fast or he wanted to fight, I think that's the guy I fought the most in my career is, is him. I think we've, we fought like four times. So, um, he's definitely one of those guys that, um, I would love that love to have had on my team. Um, did you ever meet him off the ice and, and like have a, a decent interaction or no? Never, okay. never. Okay. But I, I know off the ice. going to sucker you at the nice supermarket. Guy. Oh yeah. hundred percent. He would have. <laughs> you used to battle with Corey Perry too. And then I remember at the Olympics, you just screaming at him on the ice, on the bench. I was like, <laughs> I remember being like, that's when I was like, Kessler's a fucking animal. Like you and him must have had some wars back in the day. Oh yeah. You know, I, I remember what you coming off the, uh, I think it was after the second period, uh, I, the first game we played on. Yep. And, and you, you scored the best the room and you're like, time. you're in their fucking head cast. You're in both their heads. Keep doing it. Keep they doing were it. So mad. They were fucking <laughs> so mad. Oh my god. But uh, that was the best. I I just said it. That was the best empty net goal maybe of all time. Would you say at least for you? Oh yeah. Oh, Remember um, that biz? I'm surprised I didn't get a penalty. Looking back at it, um, if I would have missed the puck, I probably would have taken a penalty like an idiot. But I just saw the puck and I'm like, I, I don't even know what I was thinking. <laughs> it just went in. Yes, Bisman, I mentioned the Stanley Cup a few minutes ago, the Cup run versus the Bruins in 2011. Sorry to bring up a sore subject, but how come Vancouver looked like such a different team in Boston than they did at home during that series? What, like, what was such the big difference? Obviously, a loud building, but you guys looked like the opposite team when you were in Boston. You, you know what? If you look back at the series, I think the the call against Aaron Rome with uh, Nathan Horton hit, I think oh, that's yeah. what cha changed the series. If you look at that game, we are all over them. The start of the game, all over them. Then they call that five minute major or whatever. They the league suspends Aaron Rome, which there there it was like a second is not considered late. It was like one point two seconds. Yeah. So like was... the the point two seconds late is is apparently a six game suspension or yeah, five game suspension in the Stanley cup finals, which that's is a 25 game suspension in the regular <laughs> season. Let's call it spade a spade. Right? That's a like, lot of inflation. A, Cass. I'll give you, I'll give you like 12. I'll give you 12, 12. Okay. 20. I'll give you, 20. I think they say one, <laughs> one playoff game is three regular season. And then if you go to the final, 
you could argue that a final game could be for regular season. So he's not actually that crazy. That's there, how basically. Canadians view it. Six Stanley Cup games is uh, is basically like life in prison. <laughs> <laughs> no parole. No parole. Uh, you're, no, you're but done. I think that was the that was the electric point. chair. Yeah, that was the turning point. Absolutely. You know, we you look at that and then the way they're calling the series it wasn't to our game. We're a team that, yeah, we were physical and and we like to muck it up, but they just wanted to beat the shit out of us and they allowed everything to happen. And, you know, saying, saying that we, we kind of allowed it and we didn't, we had no pushback. And especially in Boston, when you start, they start pouring it on and pouring it on. And that locker room is the worst in the league, by the way. That visitors room, the Boston Bruins visitors room. I mean, I played in the coast, so like that's that's still a resort to me, right? I'll no, stay at a, no I'll stay chance. at a three star. It's, I'll stay at the cockroach instant. I don't, I don't even think a, a peewee team would fit in that in that uh, locker room. It was tight. <laughs> it was tight. It wasn't uh, comfy. But those fans are are ruthless. Like <laughs> there's stories about you know my wife going there for game six and, and all the wives going there. Cause we could have won in game six and uh, people pissing in a cup and throwing piss on people. And Holy like, shit. it was just, it was ruthless. So yeah, uh, you're, you're, you're looking at one of them. It's a uh, rear Admiral. <laughs> no, there, was a, there was a busload of Philly fans who came up for the game. It was yeah. Yeah. Right. All right. Chucking piss on guys, wives. Ah. Come on. Class it no, up, but, hey, but and then and was, then if they would have won, he would have been in their room celebrating. Yeah. <laughs> hey, how about those assholes up in the crowd, eh? Like, <laughs> on his disposable. <laughs> oh yeah, but going into Game Seven, I honestly thought we were going to win. Uh, I there was no nothing in my mind that was like no, we're, we're, like I was like no, we're going to win no matter what. Like we're going to do this at home. We can't lose. Like zero chance. So on the way to the rink, I get pulled over by a cop and like literally right in front of the stadium. And then, you know, Vancouver, Vancouver's crazy, right? And Stanley cup final game seven, imagine all the fans outside. So they start recognizing it's me and they start just giving it to this poor cop. And he, they gave it to him so bad. That he's like, just get the fuck out of here. <laughs> and he let me go. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, you guys like he's now school. in the witness protection program because <laughs> the fan base thinks it, it threw the feng shui off. Yeah. That's how crazy those fans are. Yeah. hundred mm-hmm. percent. That, that was a wild night, but going into that last game, I, I remember I was actually in the arena walking around and I've seen a couple of guys with your team. They seemed kind of real tense. You know, nobody smiling. Then the Bruins were all playing soccer on the corner. So were you guys just a little too tense going into that game? You think, or were you guys, you know, loosey goosey? You know, I think, you know, I think we're confident, but at the same time, it's, it's a Stanley cup game seven um, team. That's never, never won it before um, the team that, you know, you're playing in a Canadian market. And I do think that's, that's why it's so hard to win in a Canadian market is because uh, you know, it's, it's the, the, the stress, the, the pressures amplified that much and uh, the fans live and die by their team and we i i do believe we felt stress i do believe we we felt the pressure and i just i I think if we would have scored the first goal we would have been all right but after letting up the first one it kind of deflated us and we had no response uh later on and it was years years later but you ended up um agreeing to to a trade to anaheim you had a no trade clause at the time correct yeah yeah no trade that must have been hard, though, right? With the career you'd had, and, and it, it must have been difficult to say goodbye, even though it was kind of looking like the down times were beginning, right, in Van? From, from my understanding, you did you ask for that? I did, yeah. Oh, I, oh I, shit. Yeah, so yeah. That, that, that turned the fan base on you a little bit. Right? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I think why the fan base was so upset with me because I quote-unquote lied to him, which I lied to him because – I was told by upper management and the PR people to not say that I wanted for wanted to trade because someone leaked it. And then I had media asking about it and I'm like, no. And they gave me this whole spiel on, on what to say. I mean, what you played in, in Canada, you know what it's like. Um, 
you're in one it, it's it's uh they gave me like this whole page of you know say this 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 and this and i said it and then all of a sudden it comes out and someone said i wanted a trade and and you know yeah i, I did ask for a trade but it, it was mainly so that um well one i you know i wanted to win a cup and it was you know it was going like this in Vancouver. The the good years were over and I, I wanted to go to a contender where I could win a cup and get that feeling like 2011 again. And I just, to be honest, I wanted to live a normal life with my family and I, I, I wanted to, to ha have them go to school and, and not be known as, as Ryan Kessler's daughter. But before That's you went to Anaheim, you were there for uh, torts is one and done. How was that experience playing at torts for a year? Oh, I love Torts. I absolutely love the guy. He's a fucking beauty. <laughs> like, uh, he he is one of those guys that it doesn't matter if it's game one or game eighty or any game in between. He comes in and he has he's the best motivational speaker ever. He'll come in and he's a military guy, right? And and he just uh, he he's just such a I, I, I have a love hate with him and. He's a guy that, you know, first he comes in, he rips my A off my chest and he tells me that, you know, my team doesn't trust me and, you know, the, the management doesn't trust me and I don't work hard enough in this. And he's just like, cut me down. I think this is all a part of his plan, right? Like, like just come in and, and make a big splash and, and, you know, go at me because he, you know, I think he knew I could take it. And so, you know, continue it. And he starts, so it's around what one's trade deadline, February. So I'm in Phoenix. I think I get traded to Pittsburgh. Trade ends up being a hoax or, or something happened. So the next day, like we play, play the next day in Dallas, I want to say, we, we played like shit. I think we lost like five, nothing come in and we go over video and, and every clip's just about me like over and over and he finally stops the clip and he's like, I'm fucking worried about you, Kess. I'm really worried about you. You want out of here. And I said, you don't have to fucking worry about me and trade deadlines pass now. Right. I'm staying. Um, and I'm like, you don't have to fucking worry about me. Like, fuck you. He's like, fuck you. And it just goes back and forth. And like, he's, I stand up in my stall. He's his, his nose is like in my chest and I'm looking down <laughs> at him. Like, you want to make this about me and you? Yeah, I want to make this. And we just went back and forth. And I had, and then he's, he's like, he throws a tantrum. He throws the remote and he's like, I'm fucking out of here. And he leaves. So he, like, I, I had a bunch of young guys coming up like, Oh, that's the best thing I ever seen. Cause no one stands up to the guy. Like, ev like everybody respects him, but they're also scared of him. So he comes up on the, onto the ice and I'm skating around. And he comes up and he shoves me on the ice. Like the T like it, this is in Vancouver. Like there's cameras in the, in the bleachers or, or in the stands and they're all like, and I'm like, Holy shit, we're doing this right now. I'm going to fight a coach. Like I'm <laughs> fighting a coach on the ice right now. The and then that's going through my mind. And he pushes me again. And I turn to him and he's like, I fucking love it. Kess. That's, that's why, that's why you're going to be back. If I'm back here and you're back here, you're going to get your A back. And I go, Torts, I'm not going to be back here. And you know you're not going to be back here. So that's not going to happen. And he starts laughing and he skates away. <laughs> that is an all-time fucking story. That that's an awesome. all-time story. Hey, though, that's how those guys are. They want fucking guys to bark back at them. He oh, wants yeah. that reaction. He wants he, it. We, we had Felino on here. I told the story on the TNT broadcast. Like, he fucking got there, and I believe Felino was a captain, and he called him in. He's like, I don't think you're captain material. Yeah. Right? Isn't that what he said when he came on? And then, yeah. like, but Felino was like, he's like, I didn't fucking, like, I didn't go poopy pants. He's like, I wanted to fucking prove to this motherfucker that I was a captain, and he did. And, like, eventually, Torts came around. He's like, fuck, I was wrong about you. Mm -hmm. Like he loves, he loves the challenge guys. He wants that back. So then you go from torts to Bruce Boudreaux. <laughs> what kind of culture shock Brucey. is that? Brucey, that guy, he's a beauty. That guy is, uh, <laughs> it, it was weird because like, you know, in Anaheim, our kids, our kids weren't allowed to be at the arena. And, um, in Vancouver, our kid, my kids grew up at the rink. Like I'd bring my kids every day. So that was a culture shock one. And then you got Brucey and, and Brucey, I remember like one of my first games, I, 
there was a trainer door that was connected and I opened like the doors cracked and it goes into the head coach's office and I peek in there and you got Bruce with a big Coke and a bag of popcorn and he's laying back in his chair with his head back and he's just sleeping. This is like minutes before he's coming in to talk to us. <laughs> and I'm just like, I look at, and the trainer just gives me one of these like, Oh, well, I don't know what I'm like, you might want to wake him. He's supposed to come. <laughs> But that, that was a complete cost. It like best human, like just salt to the earth kind of guy, like little quirky, but like, I, I love the guy. Like he, he's, he's a, a, a really good dude. Um, he allows you to play. He, that's why he has really good regular season uh, teams is, is he allows people just to play. Like he doesn't get on guys and he just allows you to be creative within his system. What's his system? <laughs> I don't Eat think barbecue anybody, wings. No. Yeah, I, I don't know if any of us know. <laughs> what did you say, Lit? Eat barbecue wings. Oh, like, no, leave some of it on your shirt. Uh, uh, <laughs> you fucking. Uh, that is so funny. He, he he used to have steak, and then he piled meat sauce on top of it, <laughs> and you wouldn't even know he had a steak under there. <laughs> the guy's an all-time beauty. All-time beauty. Sneaking cookies. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> uh, oh. so uh was bob he a good murray. motivator you guys know bob murray at all he was our bob. gm yeah oh, bob's yeah. a real nice guy very oh, yeah. friendly fun to be very, around i was a very big fan friendly, very friendly guy so he, he would ask me like hey Cass, and this is like an old school line he's like hey Cass, how you feeling i'm like and obviously i was banged up from my hip i'm like ah oh, feel like a million bucks bob problem is you're paying me seven <laughs> <laughs> and he just shake his head and like walk away like just like disgusting. legit pissed <laughs> legit pissed he was always pissed like i've never yeah. i mean i was there for one year i never saw him happy once granted he uh, traded kunitz for me so every time he saw me he's like oh, <laughs> piece of shit. <laughs> this guy's gonna get me fired these are the decisions oh, that kill me. I was I was injured with my hip, and I was coming. Uh, it was Halloween party, and I I went as like Big Bird, but like Big Bird, it was like seven feet tall. Like I looked out of like the neck, it was feathers everywhere, and I bought like I, I think like ten costumes, and there was like ten of us that went as Sesame Street characters. I I ordered a big yellow school bus. We showed up at the party. We all got out of the school, but it was great. So the next day, I show up to the rink before the guys go on, I get dressed in another room with like this big bird costume on. And I go and I start skating around the ice and everybody's just looking at me like, you're an idiot. I didn't know I was shedding feathers the whole time. So you can imagine how pissed Randy Carlisle and Bob Murray was that they spent like 30 minutes plucking feathers off the ice. That is so before funny. practice, you got a bunch of NHL players just scooping feathers off the ice. <laughs> um was was this a rumor did you and bexa get in a scrap in an elevator uh it might have happened i don't recall if it did oh, no okay. no it wasn't it was cassian oh okay okay yeah, they him went and cassian that. yeah because uh I, you know obviously you guys had a bunch of your battles but i actually texted him and he said uh, ask him ask him about the superman tattoo but it was a k oh yeah you had to you had to remove where, where, yeah <laughs> Where was that? Uh, I didn't have it removed. I still have it. It's, uh, you know, when you're 17 and you think you're Superman, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you obviously do stupid shit. And, and now I at least know not to do stupid shit when I look at it. <laughs> is that is this, dethrone the pumpkin tattoo wit? Yeah. This is Biz's favorite time of year though. He's got a stale pumpkin on his arm. Free cover <laughs> charge. October. Free cover he's charge. living, he's living <laughs> good. <laughs> 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 just what's what's the michael jackson song Thriller. and then um he goes um ask him about the one night at the hotel when rooming together we watched paranormal activity and he made me turn the light on i made him turn the light on he would he he oh, he's watch it. Scary oh movies. he's cheating no nah, he says that you made him no. turn the light on. this guy won't even watch chucky or, or child's <laughs> play like he 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 hates scary movies hates it and I'm like, I, I'm a big scary movie guy. Like, I I love this, but wouldn't watch it. I did, I did no, I did watch Paranormal Activity on the plane 
and I was I was petrified, petrified. That scared the shit out of me. That movie, but I'd never turn the lights on. Uh-huh. He was a big light guy. He had his sound machine. He needed <laughs> like the first time he brought it to the room. I'm like, I wake up and I hear this like static and i think he's in the shower and i hear it for like two hours and i'm like this guy's still in the shower i, I roll over he's still sleeping in the bed it's it's his he, he brought like this portable sound machine on the road i'm like it's what is this babies. guy doing? it's like white oh, noise right yeah white noise yeah so what's the song there's only one guzzler all about <laughs> oh, jesus guzzler Oh, guzzler. I, I don't know where they came up with this, but apparently uh, they started calling me the guzzler. I don't know why. That's a Never tough learned. Nickname. I, it <laughs> oh, is a that's tough a, name. That's thanks a tough thanks one. for bringing that one up. Yeah, what a, really hand, what a handle. That. Haven't what heard a handle that, name that is. in like 15 years. <laughs> it wasn't the hips. It was actually because he got the nickname the guzzler that made him retire. Um, <laughs> was. Uh, was it difficult retiring like like the not being able to be in that rhythm of going to the rink like how much did you miss that when you first got out of the game it was brutal i missed it a lot i think that's part of the reason we moved back to michigan is because i i i just didn't want to see anything anaheim i didn't want to be like in in the same place that i was playing um professionally i just thought it would bring back too many uh too many feelings about going to the rink and, and my routine and that. So we decided to move back just to kind of start a new life. And um, it's, it's been good it, saying that it's been hard. And and the things I miss the most is, is the stuff we talk about, you know, the locker rooms, the stories going on the road, hanging out with the boys, having 23 guys that have the same goal as you to, to, you know, just, just going on the ice every day and having that set routine of, of, uh, you know, game day, non game day. And, but the things that I missed, you know, I don't miss anymore. The birthdays, uh, you know, Christmas, all, all the stuff that, you know, having to leave on the 26th after Christmas, um, is brutal. And, you know, being able to spend time with family and, and having the kids around the round, grandma and grandpa and and their aunts and uncles is was really important to us so saying that i i you know i still do miss it i mean there there's always going to be a part of me those were you know some of the best years of my life is is being able to play in front of eighteen thousand fans but not only that but just the friendships and the bonds you grow um you know that you last for a lifetime but even when you don't see each other you still like when you see each other it's like you guys have never left right so um, that's the, that's the stuff I miss. What's the latest with the Kess house? Oh, huh. we're going to go there. Eh? Our uh, army said it's like a compound and you got everything. He said it's the sickest house. Look he's at ever this seen. on YouTube folks. It's one of the sickest houses I've ever seen him. Where is that? It's in, uh, in like Detroit Metro area, West Bloomfield. Oh, it's, uh, shit, it's, yes. it's on a, a private lake, which is nice. So we don't get the, the jet ski idiots that just come come on the weekends and rip around so it's a <laughs> it's a it's a pretty calm lake and uh we you know it, it evolved over time but it is it is a bit of a compound it's kind of ridiculous but <laughs> it's 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 where we retired and and it's 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 our forever home so we're uh we're in this for the long haul and the thing with kessa's house is we're going to start another season but um you know it just I think Sportsnet changed bosses and I don't know what happened. Apparently the new boss is, I don't know. It apparently doesn't like my show and they canceled me. <laughs> hey, what's a jet ski idiot? A guy that uh, has one jet ski on one trailer, pulls it in and he's one guy or he might bring his nut- buddy and go nuts to butts, but uh, <laughs> He, he he pulls it in, he docks it, he probably loses it, has to go swim for it. It's his first time jet skiing, probably doesn't have his boater's license, and then he has no idea what he's doing. He's he's jumping wakes behind tubers, you know, like you should uh, like I don't yell a lot anymore, but like when people are doing stupid shit behind my boat, my kids are on the tube, oh I let them have it. <laughs> I wonder if Johnny Goudreau's a jet ski idiot. Oh, I, I heard about him being a jet ski idiot. 
Johnny boy. He's probably happy I'm out of the league. That guy <laughs> took some some abuse from me. <laughs> oh man, that's good. That's I good think stuff. there's a lot of guys that are probably pretty happy they don't have to deal with you anymore, Cass. But <laughs> that's what that's what made you, you know, who you were. That's what made you so effective. And then you could also score like Biz brought up. So I know we, we've kept you a long time. I can't thank you enough, dude, for joining the show. It's long overdue. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. It was fun. We'll get out to Kess's house. Hey, we'll get out to Kess's house. Yeah, could we do a piece with you? We'll come, like, live on your compound? Yeah, live in the guest house, long as you want. I'm we'll in. do a, what's the What's the 10 events? Like a dicathlon? <laughs> dicathlon? I have no I idea. Decathlon. Let's do it, though. Yeah, we'll do, like, 10 different events. Buddy, this has been awesome. I could talk to you for fucking days. Uh, our fans are going to love this. You're a warrior. Congratulations on an unbelievable career. Fuck five Selkie nominations. I'm glad you got that one league award, man. That's something to be proud of. Yeah, so thank you. I know you never got your cup, buddy, but it's not to, it's not for a lack of trying, buddy. You laid it on the line. So thank you so much for joining us. And Biz, yeah, thanks. What he might get a he might uh, get a Quebec Pee Wee Championship coming Good up luck. in February. Yeah. Hey, you never Good know. Good luck in that, Cass. I love it. Yeah, thanks, buddy. And maybe Great we'll do a sandbagger you, sometime, buddy. Get those competitive juices flowing. Just oh, don't yeah. fucking elbow me on yeah, the course. Yeah, I'll spear you one of us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's do it. I'm in, boys. Let's All do right, it. All right, see you, Cass. Stay, Stay healthy, Cass. buddy. Thanks a bunch, yeah, Cass. Thanks. That interview is brought to you by Verizon. And like I said before the interview, if you sign up now, you can get a new Google Pixel 7 Pro. It's unbelievable. There's never been a better time to switch to Verizon. Guys, I have been with Verizon since the beginning. My first ever cell phone in America. I bought it in Washington, PA. I've been with Verizon since the beginning. North American plans out the yin yang. They can be relied on. I love you, Verizon. And now on to the show. Man, want to send huge thanks once again to Ryan Kessler for a fantastic interview. Hopefully you uh, all enjoyed it as well. But uh, moving right along here for teams who are either doing good or bad so far. It's early in the season, but the Dallas Stars, 4-0-1 so far. Dallas has gotten at least a point in every game, earned 9 out of 10. The sit, they sit atop the conference for now. It's early. But Jake Odger picked up where he left off in the playoffs last year. He's won all four of his starts and given up just five goals. Good for a 9.59 save percentage. Joe Pavelski, what you just mentioned, them became the oldest player in franchise history to have a hat trick, passing Brad Hull. Him and his linemates, Rupe Hintz and uh, Jason Robinson, each have seven points. But looks like they're getting things done on the Pete DeBoer. Huh, Biz down there? They're humming along. I, we, I think we did a, a TNT like panel interview and they said, which team, although I kind of shit on Dallas in the situation of you know having to overpay guys and really wasn't confident in what they were going to be able to do coming into the season. I contradicted myself and saying, if there's one coach who could get it done, it's Pete DeBoer. Like he's used to going into new environments and turning things around quick. Uh, multiple Stanley cup finals appearances with, uh, with different teams, obviously. And, you know, used to having to to deal with certain personalities. So I would say that Pavelski still playing at the level that he's fucking playing at is I shouldn't be surprised by it, but he just continues to produce. Sagan has been off to an unbelievable start right from fucking game one. I think he had three apples in game one. Um, and just this Robertson missed training camp and him still doing what he's doing. Rupe hints, they, they have some bad contracts, but that's one guy who they got on a good one. And he's a big motherfucker and he can move around the ice. And you look at a guy they lost in the Chushkin where they couldn't get a big fucking body who skated well to that. That basically is a guy who replaced that significant loss. So overall, and then they got the guys on the back end and then Ottinger right back up to his old business. So I tell you what, I was. I said that they were a bubble team but would not make playoffs. They look full-fledged, ready to shove it up my hoop with the way that they've been playing out of the gate. So I didn't see this one coming. Fucking I didn't. I, remember, Biz, I mentioned that they were kind of like we didn't know. We could have we could have seen it going either direction. Um, but DeBoer is just that guy, especially when he goes somewhere right away. He's He knows Every what time. he's doing. That's a successful NHL coach. He probably looked at that roster and thought, I can get a lot more out of this than what's been going on. And the only worrisome thing about, well, the future, but hints, this is the last year of hints his deal. So as good of a deal it is right now, you, that guy's got to get paid. And that's where you look at the, the contracts that we've mentioned before in terms of how you're going to figure out how to pay the guys that are young and up and coming. But Roberts are playing this well without that. That's not, I mean, that that's the new NHL right there. The old school ways guys come in out of shape, yeah. maybe not ready to go, not being in camp. This dude was prepared. He looks awesome. Um, 
I, I the Mason Marchment signing too, man. We, oh, we wow. saw we saw the end to end goal. I think he got the first game, one of the first games of the year that was a beauty. And and then Ottinger, it's like you got this goalie. I mean, this guy is he's one point two five goals against right now, and five he's got five goals against in four games. So. I like where this team is at, right? I really do. I think that they're going to be a playoff team. And just this is the beginning, right? There's a lot of hockey left to be played, but there's not much to dislike about this team. And and the main reason, it's like you don't want to give coaches too much credit as a former player, I guess. But he obviously looked at this team and figured I can get a lot more out of them. And, and so far, it looks like that. And, and team toughness, too. Like, I know, like, for what maybe Jamie Benn doesn't do offensively, I would probably say that he's a pretty feared guy on the ice most yeah. nights, right? Like, he, you, could, you could throw him in the heavyweight category based on guys who are willing to go. Like, he, he to me, is almost like the new Getzlaff, where Getzlaff was one of those guys, too, who was willing to throw with anyone. Didn't he fucking throw down with Joe Thornton one year? We're off the faceoff? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he'll he'll go against the big boy. So with Marchment coming in too, they have this overall team toughness, which is like it's all you really need. Cause that fucking Marchment, he'll he'll he'll, he'll throw fucking he'll throw the lumber too, man. And I think the only game they lost, it was they still got a point. It was in Toronto when Robertson's brother had two goals, including the game winner. So yeah, they that looked must good. have been a special. They, they could be five and zero, no problem. Uh, the Detroit Red Wings. It's, I think it's fair to say they got a chicklets bump after we had new head coach Derek Lalonde on. 3-0-2 oh, out of the gate, 8 out of 10 possible points. Uh, but we got to talk about Dylan Locke and ensuring one of those points. I know what happened oh. right after we taped last week. With Arvidsson of the Kings going in to seal it with an empty netter, and he had a moment to shoot. He just wanted to finesse it a little more, and Dylan Locke right between his legs, poked it away. Detroit comes down, ties it up late, and yeah, that could be a huge point come playoff time, all because of the captain's hustle. Great point, but the Red Wings themselves, man, getting Husso for a third rounder, looking like a Stevie Bong, Bong Rips heist so far. 2-0-1. Oh, uh, goals against 939 save percentage, 201 record with a shout out. I mean, this guy's been unreal so far. The Delkovich isn't no slouch either. So, Biz, what have you been seeing with the Red Wings thus far? Yeah, I don't like why a third rounder? Like, what happened there? Like, he must have had like a private investigator following him around or something and had something on him, right? No, I'm serious. Yeah, that was that was bizarre. And then they he got Nadelkovich for not much either the summer before. You, so you, you get the envelope. There's a hooker sucking you off in the back seat of a, a fucking Uber car. You're like, ah, oh, fucking Christ. I love, I, I love I Perron. I got to give up my starter for a third rounder. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Bennington looks sick though. Um, get on the floor. Get hey, on the floor. Perron. What did I say? Oh, Cup he's winner, filthy. leader, oh, veteran, no. plays with an edge. He's leading the team in goals already. Yeah, and you know what? The other night. Dominic Kubalik, who <laughs> underrated player, no player. In the Detroit Red Wings has had there's one player that's had more points through the first five games of the season since 1992 than Cooper League's eight points this year. That was Paul Coffey had 10 points through five games played in 92, 93. So what a start for him as a Red Wing. And and man, I if let me get all your guys pick. If you had to pick a team to make the playoffs, Buffalo or Detroit, who are you going with? I can't get these teams out of my mind. When I think of one, I think of the other. I, I was going to say that I have Detroit. Uh, I have Detroit ahead of Buffalo right now because of the sure. goaltending. Well, j- j- yeah, just like you mentioned all these pieces too. like Kubelik was a guy. I want to say he was like fucking wasn't he like third in Calder voting the year he was a rookie. He had over 20 goals like what like. What what happened to him in the meantime? I think he had thirty at, that year. Yeah, maybe maybe he had thirty. What was he was he second or third runner up? So like they all of a sudden just like did a good job of acquiring all these like legitimate pieces. And you mentioned Perron, like you knew right away. He it's almost like the age doesn't uh, uh, affect what he's going to bring physically, but his mind just understands the game. Whether it's power play, situ- situational hockey, like he's he's got it ingrained in his brain. He's like a he's a fucking crafty crafty player so they just got so many good and mixed in with these young guys kubelik had uh in 2019 2020 he in 68 games he had 30 goals and 16 assists yeah and then he just like like fucking then all of a sudden he ends up on detroit like what what were the trades where did he go before that uh, coming over from he was in uh, chicago he was in chicago years. Yeah. yeah, that was it. And then over to over to Detroit. What he must have had him a fucking private investigator follow him around. What did they have to give up to get him? Oh, what that I, deal I, I think it was UFA. I thought. Well, listen though, this is without this starts without cop scoring yet too. UFA. The, 
one of the big uh oh Kubalik was UFA? Correct, yes. Okay, so that's a that's a great signing. And then they got cop in the UFA. He hasn't scored yet. He'll get going. And the third line, dude, it's three monsters. It's Rasmussen with Soderbaum and Sunquist. <laughs> I mean, the that might be the players. biggest line in NHL history. It is. Like, I think not they even announced joking. it as, as the biggest line. It's the creative player mode. All the all these players they did bring in this year, Biz. Uh players in the first season in Detroit, eleven goals, fourteen assists. For a total of 25 points, way better than any other teams who brought in a bunch of new guys. So, so far, so good for the London. All right. You didn't yeah. answer Witt's question, though. Who do you have making the playoffs, the Sabres or the Red Wings? I, Detroit, based on the goaltending as well. They just Me as like, well. They, plus, they, I think they were a little ahead of uh, Buffalo on the development going into the season as well. So I would I would take Detroit over Buffalo. And Murley, uh, our boy Merle's EBR, f- please follow him if you want to win money. He had his game of the month. He had his game of the month. And uh, it was Detroit on Sunday against Anaheim. They worked him an easy win, puck line and money line. And that was his uh, also preseason. I think better this season was their over points. I think it was 84, 83 and a half. half. 84 and a half. half. So Detroit's looking good. Did you see uh, as any man on the planet right now? They already got eight. Nadelkovich, he was standing behind Emily Kaplan while she was doing the report. He put a piece of tape on his blocker saying, hi, mom. So it'll be right behind us. Pretty, pretty nice little gesture. I don't know if you guys saw the tweet that was out there. Oh, yeah, a classy move. I got to say hi to mom when you can. And also, uh, we want to send our best wishes to uh, Jacob Barana. Uh, he'll be away for a little bit. Uh, he's going to be with the player assistance program. He checked himself into that. So it's personal, private. We just know uh, we wish the best for him. And hopefully he's back out in the ice soon because we hate to see guys have to go that route. But he's getting help, and that's a good thing. All right, boys. Your old team, the Pittsburgh Penguins. 4-0-1, 9 out of 10 possible points so far. Crosby just getting it done. Big shocker. Three goals, seven assists in five games. How about this? Sid has 424 multi-point games, the most among active players. He has 101 more multi-point games than zero-point games, which is stunning to say that out loud. Uh, he passed Dougie Gilmore for 19th on the all-time points list, and his 79th game winner he got the other night is a franchise best, and he's going against McDavid, well, on Monday night, so... We got to talk about the Gino birthday cake. I asked you guys, did, did he remember you guys given us the propensity to forget teammates? Did he know your names? With the Have cake? you watched the video already? I watched <laughs> it, but like I'm saying when you first like met him, I mean, I, I don't know if you met him right when the video was playing. I watched the video. That's why I brought it up. I just didn't. It was a joke, like because he doesn't. No, no. He thing. remembered us. He remembered us. He asked Whit first thing and, and like we caught on camera. He's like, you making more money now with the <laughs> vodka? Like first thing out yeah. of his mouth, he asked us about dough. That's the that's the Russian in him. Hey, why well, right. I, I don't know the... if you realize, you know, it was his cake, not his kids. Right. Right. Well, OK. That, yeah, we figured figured that out there. Yeah, I just it was it was the joke because he never remembers his teammates name. That was more of a, of a joke than anything. Let but me play cake. that clip now, boys. I'll play the clip now of him saying he is the king. It was so bad. We got the draft to it before you came. I was part of the yeah. team that was so bad. Was yeah. They signed him. We got the hype. It's not my fault. Hey, how about your son's birthday cake? Fourth, fourth cup. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw, saw that. Yeah. I saw that. It's my wife it's on Instagram. Me. Yeah, business yeah. my cake is not fun. It's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it was your birthday. No, yeah. Lion King. Lion King. Yeah. yeah. He's the king. Yeah, I'm king. That, that was like, his cake. That was his cake. <laughs> his, I think you have more money now than like you play. Fuck yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> who made more money? You or him? He He's might in the TNT end. He might now, in the yeah? end. Show me your cash. <laughs> no, no rubles. Superstar. He's a superstar. Yeah. Now. He's not too like who cool, like Wayne Gretzky. Oh yeah, he talks to Gretzky all the time. Hey, you have Wayne Gretzky phone? <laughs> Send it. <laughs> there you go. And and all right, fair enough. He knew who we were. He actually might not have known our names. Okay. So. <laughs> all right. That, that's, we should have. We, we should have like, tell me my name. Yes, to quiz him. We should. He's that's like, why we needed you there, R. Ray. He's like, fix the, hey, fix Alex that back out. Yeah, Maybe big, get that get that yeah. soas workout so we can have you there next time quizzing them for the for the behind the scenes. The that would have been funny though. There's probably teammates he's played with for three years that he does not know their names. He's a big dude too. See how like, compared to you guys off the ice, he's a monster. So I mean, Sid's being Sid. I mean, there's no chance this team's gonna not miss the playoffs this year. Biz, hey, eh? do you think he thanks us if he gets the MVP this year for the way we kicked off the start? Do you think he, we get a thank you in the speech? Do you think we so get ideally. invited to his Hall of Fame induction someday, Biz? You have to think that the, if, he, if he is going to get in, it's these later years. And with what we're providing him, I would say that there's undoubtedly, yes, we should be getting an invite. And you okay. as like a teammate, 
Me, I only played 15 games, but with the way I helped elevate his spirits when I called him out on the Jumbotron for this season specifically, I think I deserve also. And RA, I'll just sneak in. So all of us will be there. I think, I think the need- more realistic option is the is a cup party this year. I think you're, you guys are the first people he calls. Merles, he was telling Merles to buy a house in Pittsburgh last time we were there. Fuck, I think I looked. I think he needs roughly 300-ish points to be top 10 all-time in the league in scoring. So I would assume he ends up getting that, considering this year he'll probably get 100. Um, and then you look at it like, all right, well, I'm going to the Hall of Fame uh, why wouldn't I bring the guy who I said has the best offside one timer I've ever seen in the history of hockey? So I think I'm getting invited. <laughs> Seriously. Hey, do you think he's a sicko like Brady? Do you think he'll be playing until he's 48, all grayed out, looking like George Clooney? I don't with know, his salt Brady's, pepper? dude. It's a tough time right now for TB12. Holy shit. Oh yeah, if divorce start talk. That's the divorce. That his stuff. wife hired like a monster divorce attorney. Just lost to the Carolina Panthers. Like Jesus. Dude, I got a good bro- question for you guys. What do you guys think Tom uh, Sidney Crosby does after hockey? I I would. I think I, he's going Iserman route. I think he's going to build too. a sick team. These guys are sick fucks. They're man. sickos, and they want to win. Sickos. They just want to keep winning. And how are you going to be away from the game and? I don't know if he's got any desire to be on TV or media. I would. I don't know, though. It's hard because like Gretzky never got into that t- t- part of the game, right? He never got into the GM president type mode. Or did, did he? For, you did think he starts for. ripping the bong like Stevie? Why? All of a sudden, he's just like. At the local dispensary every morning when the guys <laughs> open it up, it's like, uh, Sid, you can buy more than one day's worth. Just. But he's such a creature of habit. He makes the dispensary guy list the items every morning to him. Like he it's, hires, uh, uh, he hires, uh, he hires Bugsy as part of the the scouting staff to roll his joints for him. <laughs> That's it. I got you today. Hey, let's <laughs> let's let's think of a trade, Sid. <laughs> Sid, I saw you smash that uh, stick after the game, so this one's an indica because Tiba got you a little buzzing. <laughs> and by game, I mean the, the you know the. The, the in between, what are the game they play the day of all the alumni are the alumni game every afternoon? Oh, it's yeah. A, I wonder if they still do that. There. They still do it. I do asked they? them when they were there and they said That's Mario awesome. Mario from time to time will still hop on, which is kind of sick. Imagine you're like the guy who like gets the fucking like printer paper and you're in the because they let the staff play in it, too. Yeah. You know, all yeah. Of a Wait, so what up. is that biz? Why don't you explain that every go ahead? Biz, sorry. No, what you probably know a little bit more about, it, but from my understanding is they have like a, an alumni slash staff skate uh, on the afternoons of game days that are at home. And it's like, you know, sometimes Mario will be skating in there and obviously like people from the office will. So it's kind of cool where the, that's how the organization interacts. It's so mom and pop. I, I might be off base here. I think that that is alumni mixed in with staff first, correct? Whit? I don't remember alumni but i'm guessing yeah there had to be some that would be there but i think it was like right after pregame meal yeah the people like i think some of the assistant coaches played then guys in the office everyone could play pretty much and then they'd play and then guys would get coaches maybe get their pregame shut eye in the office and next thing you know the players are rolling in for game time but it is pretty cool wait have you seen how much of the pens except for the game you're at in person uh i watched them against I'm watching them tonight. Tonight is a big tilt. McDavid versus Crosby in Edmonton, 10 o'clock. I'll be watching the Patriots Monday night game along with that. And then hopefully seeing Vancouver lose seven, nothing again. I have not. I watched Pittsburgh play one other game. Wh- who have they played so far? They just beat the wheels off the Kings in, in, a, in a response nope. to a loss. But that was, you know, that was a. Uh... Okay, well, I'll show what, game so, did, so, what game did Petrie have a goal? So, so far, they've played the Coyotes, the Lightning, the Canadians, the Kings, the Blue Jackets as well. Blue Jackets. The, the, the game against the Canadians was when Malkin had two goals. They blew the lead. They were up 2 nothing, and Montreal came storming back. I, w- I want to say they lost the game in overtime, and then Kirby Doc had the winner. You are correct, Biz. Who's, who's been oh. – oh, look at the memory on me. Pump my tires. Give it's the hikes. Job, it's Good the job, hikes. Biz. I'm the, it's I'm the, the best. It's the clean food. Just ask me. Um, but 
that was another guy who we were talking about uh, the last podcast was Kirby Doc and the impact he's had on coming on earlier. So other than that, though, that response win against LA, like this team is this team is primed and ready. We keep stroking them off too much. Everybody's saying it's turning into a Pittsburgh Penguins podcast. We we come with no bias here. I don't care that they gave me the start to my career and drafted me when I got. On. Everybody knows it's a Bruins. My ween sucked the night before. Actually, I there's a prop and uh, oh, it's too late to bet it by the hair, but there's a prop tonight. It's Sid and uh, Connor combined for five plus points in the Oilers win the game plus five hundred payout. So if you're in uh, if you're in the area, any of you four boys, it's a nice little. Payout. Well, uh, all right, they're going to be listening to this when the game's over. I just like as I just pre- prefaced that what I was just yeah. letting you fellas know. Before we go any further, I got to talk to you guys about DHM Detox. I won't even go into the story about when I went to a wedding. And I had everybody texting me the next day asking me, what was that you handed me? I feel unbelievable today. It was DHM Detox. Yeah. Under the no days wasted umbrella. They don't just got the the DHM Detox, which is the, of course, uh, makes you feel great after a night of drinking. They have the hydration replenisher. If you're watching the YouTube, it's in my water bottle right now. It has everything you need in order to keep hydrated throughout the day, especially if you are exercising and hiking like I do. They also have vitamins, plenty of other things. Visit nodayswasted.co. Uh, but guys, it's awesome. If you're going to be out for a night of drinking, make sure you take care of your body, get ahead of it because you got to wake up the next day and be productive. And how are you going to do so? DHM detox and no days wasted. Yeah. Biz 20 promo code, motherfucker. Uh, the Boston Bruins, we just mentioned them. 5 0 and 1 out of the gate, 10 points, leads the league. Uh, Patrice Bergeron passed the great Rick Middleton with his 403rd goal as a Bruin. Now in third place in team history behind only Johnny Busick and Phyllis Pizzito. Uh, and this team, just a completely different team with David Krejci back in the lineup. Last year, they had Eric Holler playing second line center. No offense yeah, remember Granelli? He's a great no, player. But but hey, well, I told you defense. all year, Wit. I told you, if they brought Krejci back, Holler wasn't capable. You I would always tell you. He was like whoa, an whoa, unbelievable whoa, whoa. second line center. Guys, hey, Pull the clip, Holla, Holla did a fucking great job in the second half of the season last year. Let's not yeah, just shit on Holla here. Dude, when the first line wasn't on the ice, you had no faith watching the Bruins that they could score. And I would tell you that all the time. All right. All right. Go back to stroking these guys off. Absolutely. Totally different team with him out there. Uh, Krejci and Pasta combined for 17 points so far. Ten forwards have scored at least one goal. Nick Foligno had his third already. He only had two all last season. Not being a dick to him. He was hurt a lot last season. But he's already got three goals. He's been contributing. Some bad news, though. Uh, Brandon Carlo had to leave the game the other day. He got yet another concussion. This is scary now. Apparently his fifth, like, confirmed concussion since 2017. So, you, you know, I think you have to get to that point of how much longer does you want to oh play the God. game. Oh, my God. And Jake Muzzin, the same thing. You feel Ugh. for these guys. It's such a scary time when you continue to rack these up. It's like this Carlo has looked so promising every time he's healthy. And then just when he rounds the corner, this stuff happens. It sucks. It fucking sucks. Yeah. It makes and me and feel it- sick to my stomach for a young guy that's just because it's not the it's not the knee and the shoulder that you can rehab. It's just so scary. And, you know, when you get more, they just come a lot easier because the last one, it didn't look like a typical hit that would cause a concussion, but because of his history, it was. So we're wishing, wishing the best for that guy. And, you know, hopefully he makes the Well, who did we have on? Or a post He talked about when he had his, he just, it was the, a, a little weird movement and he just, yep. all of a sudden he felt off. Like, that's the crazy part too, is like back in the day, like, a coach might watch that on video and be like, are you fucking kidding me? You're going to fucking be out with a concussion because of that. But now that we know so much more about it, like you're saying that they, you're more susceptible and they come easier and easier. Like it's so like such for such a young guy too, like you said, with a promising career, it's fucking, it fucking blows, man. But overall, from a team standpoint, uh, I, Halsey's looked awesome. Yeah. You mentioned like Nick Felino not being healthy last year. Like, fuck, that's a guy that they paid 4 million bucks to. Like they need him being a contributing factor. So it's great to see him off to a, a great start. And I'm sure, you know, you talk, we talked to him when we interviewed him about how he handled when, when Torts called him out saying he wasn't captain material. Like, you know, he wanted to come back and make a fucking impact. So I was wrong about these guys. I thought that they were going to be a little bit too old, a little bit too slow. And maybe that's the kick in the ass they needed. I was going to say, I think, we'd be remiss if we don't mention Jake DeBrusque. I mean, five points, five games looks like a fully new player now that they have the new coach Monty in there. I mean, he he's playing on one of the best contracts in the NHL right now, four mil a year, first line player. Come on. Did did, Uh, did we go over this and the fact that it it was 
maybe be known to everyone that he was the whipping boy a little bit when it came to Bruce Cassidy? Well, I think it was evident once he, you know, said trade me and then he got fired. He's like, I don't want to be traded anymore. <laughs> that he hated his guts and Krejci's willing to come back when he when he, when he's gone. Holmes. But uh, quickly to Felino, the one thing I noticed, and yeah, health is such a big, he looks quicker. I would love to chat with him. If you remember and you've never listened, his interview with us last season or whatever this summer was awesome. Great guy. And I wonder if he changed his training a little bit or maybe lost a little weight. He looks noticeably quicker out there. Good for him. Um, yeah. Uh, Debrusque is so fast. I think sometimes there's Bruins fans who maybe will whine about his hockey sense a little bit. But you can't have it all. And he's so quick and he's got a great shot and he's able to kind of produce off offense off of his speed. So... I love how he's playing. Bergeron is the master. And then the fact that they're doing this without arguably their two best players in McAvoy and Marshawn is the craziest thing. And I think the final shout out is Pasternak, who I've never seen look this good. And this is a guy who's had moments of being a complete superstar in this league, but he's at another level right now. And and so the fact that these guys are stepping up, Halsey playing like this before Marshawn gets back is just so big. And it's really a last dance that we've talked about situation. And it's, for Bruins fans, I think it's more than anything exciting because you now know the team can score. Right now, they are leading the league in goals. I don't know if that'll be able to continue, but Marshawn coming back, that's a lot more goal scoring right there. So it's it's a great start for a team who needed it with two big pieces out. And Grizzlick's already back, which I think was early. Yeah, he was ahead of schedule. He's on the juice. And I've been hearing well, locally the uh, Bruins really like Montgomery. He doesn't get on him for every little thing. You know, if a mistake happens, he's like, hey, shit happens. Just, you know, to get back out there. He's very approachable. Talk to the guys about anything. And, the, you know, the results speak for themselves right now. The team realizes, I think they were like gun shy un- under uh, Bruce Cassidy, particularly the younger players. But it's sort of a new, uh, I don't want to say it's a team culture, but a new culture with the coach. And I think players are much more comfortable this year than they were last year. Basically, what yeah, I not told. gripping their sticks as tight, man. Yeah. Coach, get off my nuts, bro. I'm Seriously. trying to make some fucking plays out here. Bitch. Let me make a play at the blue Holy. line. Fuck, yeah. man. Get off my ass. Oh, I'll throw dude. some backhand sauce, motherfucker. I make four million. Can I not just chip it in like biz? Fucking curb stomp, you <laughs> bitch. Uh, you guys mentioned nuts. pasta. I'd love to hear what you guys think he's going to get on this next contract. Money, 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 11 money, and a half. Money. 11 and a half for eight years. Money, 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 money. Ooh. Dude, what? he comes in with a custom uh, suit of just fucking cash. <laughs> what would pasta get on the open market? Probably more. Uh, oh, 17 no, million a more. year. I'd say 12 on the open market. Give if him the a fucking Bruins, shoe if deal the Bruins too. could ever, if the Bruins could ever get him eight years at like 82, they'd fucking take it. And I mean, okay, that would well, be, what's the math on that for us knuckleheads here? I don't like want to get eight, on my calculator. Uh, what would it be? It would like be Texas like 10, 10. 10.2 or, or right around 10 to 10.5 a year. I don't know if they could get him to, to agree to that, but. That would be nice because this guy is nasty. I love watching Pasternak play. He's one of the most entertaining people for me. Has to there watch. ever been a superstar? I mean, okay, we can't say McKinnon because at the time in which like he signed it, he he thought that that was a good deal because he said that he'd had an off year and the next year was the one that he ended up popping off. Who is one guy who has maybe said like, I don't care about the money and took an insane team friendly deal? Like, what if Pasta goes? Just give me eight times eight. Yeah, it's just important. <laughs> it, 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 the reason that really doesn't happen, not the not the main reason, because guys want what they're worth, but agents can't really allow it to happen because it really fucks over other players. And that for a reason, a long, I think there was a long time when Ray Bork was so underpaid that it hurt other defense and around the league. And and I I think if you look around it, when guys sign deals and it's way undervalued, it really does hurt players that are looking for contracts in the next few seasons. So you, you don't want to Bruins- hurt your you don't want to hurt your brethren, Biz. What if he's like, I don't give a fuck about the brethren. I'm a B till I die, bitch. Eight times eight, motherfucker. Slap it down. Ride or die. <laughs> Jake, the Jacobs are still like, no, man, too much. <laughs> Marshan at six one two five is probably one of the best deals in the NHL as That's well. He took a huge oh, yeah. That might that might be the best. Three more years too. Holy shit, that's some bang for your buck. All right, next up is... is no wonder he's in fucking Cuba on the beach saying, fuck you guys, start the season without me. I'm all, I'm underpaid, motherfucker. One, one of your two teams, Biz, the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, starting out four and two. Uh, they did lose to your other team. You must have been torn when they played the Coyotes last week, huh? Very confused. 
Very like, who do you root for on that? What situation? is that? What is that point streak? That crazy point streak. Biz so now? yeah. So since right. 2002, the Coyotes have been able to manage at least getting one point on the road in Toronto. <laughs> That's fucking yeah. Yeah. I will say I is you know I was with the Coyotes for five years. Every time we went there, we had success. Fuck, I even got a game winner one night. <laughs> That's how fucking much the least stunk. Oh my god, that's uh, the least for but you. listen, I agree with what Sheldon Keefe said, and some people were kind of on him for getting on the players. Like, holy fuck, have we become soft? I can't but, believe he apologized. Yeah, dude. then he backpedaled. That's in fucking embarrassing. That was so brutal. He didn't even Bro, say they anything. Make, they make they make eleven million bucks a year, man. You can say that our elite, we have elite players, and they don't. Fair comment. Like no, yeah. no what offense to Clayton Keller. There's said. players of different stature on the Leafs roster, and they're paid as such. Our elite players, who we have and they don't, weren't elite tonight. <laughs> Holy fuck, dude! Ah, uh, no. Tortorella would have had them sitting millionaires row, and he, he, they would have had the fucking laser pointer out between periods, and they probably would have had to went to the safe space room at the ACC or whatever the fuck they call it because of how much he would have torn a strip into their asshole for how they were playing against the Desert Dogs. So, yes, I was torn because, you know, I want to see these guys have success and win games, but I also fucking want Connor Bedard. So I'm like, come on, Lee. Don't worry. And don't worry. You'll, you'll have a great Coyotes chance. Maybe fucking Connor. pull a goalie here in the second. Let them come, come back. So. Yeah, awful performance. The biggest takeaway, though, was the fact that he had to apologize for those comments where I'm like, this is fucking nuts, man. Like, who did that come down from? That's your concern after that performance was was uh, being a little too hard on the guys. Whew. What do I you think? I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And, and like, Marner was asked about it. He's like, yeah, you know, stuff said behind closed door. It's just like, he didn't even say anything. Try fucking playing for Terrian. Little fucking soft brats. They need to. They 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 can't be called out. Can you not be called out, Toronto? What the fuck? What the hell is that? I I, I don't. I do not understand the whole vibe in, in in Toronto. It's just such an odd place because there are so many storylines every single day that you end up just wondering, like, wait, so the media can get on the superstars when they're not playing well, but if the coach ever says anything about them then the media will back the superstars because the coach shouldn't have called. It's just, there's, it's so confusing to me, but for one, one thing's a fact. And that is when a coach ends up call, and I'm using air quotes as calling out their star players and then apologizing for it. Is that not a tough look for the coach? I looked at more like a compliment. He called them all elite. That was it. And we off the stage. Well, either way afterwards, they did win the next two games after being called out. Uh, they beat Dallas. Uh, like you said, Nick Robinson earlier, he had his first multi-goal game and his first OT winner. He also became just the second player ever to score his first regular season OT goal in a game in which his brother was the opponent. I know they come up with these crazy stats. That was obviously his brother, Jason. But how about Sam Sonoff? He's allowed two goals or fewer in each of his four starts. I mentioned he could have been a real diamond yep. in the rough they found. But another thing, too, Biz, they put Clifford and Simmons back in the lineup Saturday. The Leafs play their best game of the season. Is that a coincidence or no? I love it. I love when you got guys running around, and it, it, I think that the I think the fucking star guys love it too, man. They get to fucking do whatever they want. They get to bark back. They get to try things, and like you know, the other team's going to be on their toes. Those are two guys that put them in the heavyweight category. Um, did you guys see this clip of of uh, Dubas snapping in the box and like swearing and shit? Is. Did I it ever cut? Did I it couldn't... ever come out what he was? What was he so pissed about? It was the goal that they that they ended up. Um... It was the it was the Dallas goal that they ended up counting. I don't know if it was counted a Dallas goal as a goal or they took away a Toronto goal. I'm not exactly sure, but it, it doesn't even matter because my main focus on that or my main takeaway was like, if this guy's this emotional, it, it was honestly like seeing a GM in a playoff game. I, I love like, it. This is the fourth game of the year, dude. You're going <laughs> to have a fucking. What do you get when you're all stressed out, R.A.? A hernia? Uh could be a lot of things. Hemorrhoids. Like, just, oh, my God, the amount of stress 
to work for that team. It's the fourth game of the I, year. I love that though. I oh, like buddy, seeing you. GM that was... that's 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 not healthy. Oh, listen, hey, listen, buddy. I, I would love to be like Stevie Ron- Bong Rips and and be up in the box and show no emotion and be so fucking cool that my life is depending on these wins and losses. Dubas is our. And I kind of like seeing the emotional roller coaster ride. I want to watch that shit from a fucking general manager. I love that. That's I think it's fun to watch, but like looking at it and thinking like if that was me, it's like, oh my God, like that is just, there's so much stress that goes with that. If that's how you're acting about a goal being called off or whatever it was in the fourth game of the year. Well, he had his favorite soap opera. Uh, did you think that was a hand pass though on that goal? It, it, because Keller's stick was kind of there at the same time. I was surprised that they actually. Okay, looked- so you mentioned the Dallas game. You're saying that head shake was associated to when the it was against the Coyotes when Riley was in the offensive zone, or Morgan Riley, excuse me. And no, it wasn't that. It was something from the Dallas game. Okay, well, but then Ra going back to yours. That was another moment in that in in a different game where yeah. the goal ended up being called back. Yep, they thought they tied it 3-3. Instead, any, any goal in the last minute or in overtime, they, the Situation Room reviews it. And the Situation Room, funny, they always say go to Toronto. It was in Toronto. And they said, no, it was a hand pass. And some of the replays, I don't know, man. I, I could see why they were pissed off because it looked I, like Clayton Keller's stick got there the same no, time. No, I know. I, 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 I was kind of surprised because it did hit his stick. But I guess the rule is that they have to get possession. Yeah. That it would have to, it would have to, and that's not considered full possession, just a deflection off the stick. I was surprised though, because watching that, I thought it would count. And then to get get it taken away, I guess technically Toronto never lost possession after the, the hand pass, which wasn't even on purpose. So tough call though. Yeah. I thought I thought because he punched at it and it almost looked like he met where Clayton Keller's stick was. It's weird because it was almost like a loose puck battle. And it just so happens it hit his hand, went right to the ground. And as you said, Keller then made contact. So it's just like, fuck, man, that's that's as close as you're going to come. I, I felt that they, 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 sh- they probably should have countered it. And even a lot of Coyotes Me fans too. on a lot of Coyotes fans online were saying like, hey, we'll take the win. But you guys got hoes there. <laughs> A lot of Coyotes fans online. <laughs> All my burner business accounts. Business, <laughs> <laughs> business uh, four yeah. burners and then his Aunt Marsha. <laughs> All right, swinging out to the West. Uh, Vegas Golden Knights, a uh, 4-2-0 right now as Logan Thompson has looked very much like a number one goalie in the NHL. Uh, he's 2-2 two and two with the 2.29 goals against, a 9-2-6 save percentage. Uh, Jesse Granger of The Athletic wrote a terrific story about him and his history and how he got there. Uh, he's the first Canadian university goalie to start since 1990 and the first to appear since 1994. This guy was never drafted. He was offered an East Coast contract after his freshman year. He was cut after the season, signed with the AHL Hershey team the next year, ends up signing with Vegas. He's just one of these guys who believed in himself and betting himself, and now he's a number one goalie, undrafted story. Biz, you already checked that out, right? Just a tremendous uh, well, we bumped inspirational into story. I'd heard the story last year very briefly where like people bringing it up. It's awesome that they did a, a deeper dive into, you know, where he's came from. There are a few stories of players doing it. Uh, uh, did the article say who the guy who to do it in 1990, you said was the last time a goalie came from Canadian university. Uh, uh, yeah. First Canadian university goalie to start since 1990 or to start. Who, who, do you know who the guy was? And in, in you know, it, it wasn't. Preface. No, it wasn't. It wasn't in the in the paragraph. So but I mean, fuck. We everybody loves a come up story like this, and and with the information that we got about Leonard being injured, knowing that he was probably going to come in and be the starter, it's exciting, man. They just gave him a three year deal at a great bargain, and you know, you you know, you you feel like you're playing with the house's money, and you know, you don't feel like you're constantly competing, and it seems like it's done wonders for him. And I think he can take it and run. And just from meeting him, and he had his goalie trainer that he was working with when I saw him. I think it was in Regina where I bumped into him. Uh, or maybe it was Brandon. And that's where he'd played junior. So he was working with a guy that he was familiar with. It looked like he was taking his off-season tra- training very seriously. He was confident and calm going in. And I'm like, I want to ride this dark horse. And it's a fucking awesome story. Get a chance to read it. Uh, and and wit, like... I mean, fuck Canadian university hockey. Like it's not like it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a ways away, man. No, it's what the, the, the top college teams play for exhibition games. I remember we used to play like St. Francis Xavier at BU and 
the, the, the main takeaway I took out of the story is just never giving up. And I think he mentions in the article how proud his family is for just never giving up. And the fact that like pro hockey wasn't even on his mind and that he was looking at being a possible Uber driver, but his, his infinity couldn't handle the ice. It's just there's so many different storylines to show that you don't have to be the top pick. You don't have to be the guy who's the big time blue chip prospect. It's about never giving up, sticking to your um uh, sticking to believing in yourself and just grinding it out. And so Biz calling this guy top seven in Vesna. I love it now. I hope he gets top three because the, the whole story is wild. And then to see him play so well at the start of the year, it almost makes it even better because of what you've realized he's gone through to get there. Thompson became the first uh, U Sports alum to get an NHL start since University of Manitoba netminder George Manaluk started for the New York Islanders in 1990. Manaluk. So it's George Manaluk. Wow. That's a throwback Manaluk. name right there, Manaluk. Another golden night we got to talk about, Phil Kessel. Um, by the time this show drops, he probably tied Keith Yandel's Ironman streak. Uh, and if that's the case, he can break it Tuesday night. I couldn't believe when I looked up. He's in his 17th season already, Phil Kessel. Let's see. He's got 399 goals, 558 assists in 1,210 games. Another 81 points in 96 playoff games. His next goal will make him the 12th American to score 400 goals. He's got the two cups. Does Phil Kessel get into the Hall of Fame, Wit? Right now, I'm saying no. Um, <laughs> doesn't have 400 goals yet, correct? He, well, he, his next one will give him 400. All right, so he'll get 400. He won't get 500, though. No, I don't think so. Now, being the all-time leader in in the um, you know the the, the Iron Man streak, that definitely helps with the career he's had. I just look at the other guys who aren't in. And then I have a tough time saying th that he's in. So it's like, it's just a hard game because then you look at Guy Carboneau's in there. So I, I have no idea, but my, my initial reaction, what I do is when I hear of a player's name, it's, it's kind of like, yes or no. It's like when you look at a card and you have to say your, the, the, your thought that comes to mind when you see an image, no, Phil Kessel Hall of Fame. No. Does anybody take more shrapnel on the show than Guy Carboneau? <laughs> like, I, I, like I feel bad like, Guy's the ultimate this... winner And he just gets ultimate carved winner, in the Hall of Fame time, comes like, up. Yeah but Guy Carboneau's in there Like <laughs> we gotta stop that Honestly we uh, have No to... more Guy Carboneau yeah, who, slander who, who, who are we gonna say Kevin <laughs> Let's Lowe. start saying Kevin Lowe. <laughs> You know Kevin who Lowe. You know, no, 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 no no names You know who <laughs> You know who we're talking about folks You <laughs> Um Fucking who, who am I kidding? I got fucking I got RA in there as a builder for fuck's sakes. I, I'm the biggest softy when it comes to sure. Put him in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Um, But no, he's probably not going to get to the Hall of Fame. All right. Uh, Wait, I know you tweeted about the Florida Panthers and uh, Zito. The Unless other day. he gets a job at ESPN for 10 years <laughs> when he retires doing the panel. <laughs> if Kessel does the panel for 10. Fuck it. If he does it for eight, I'll throw him in there. Might make $78 million. Who knows? Before we move along, here's a word from our friends at Game Time. The NHL is back, and if you want to see any games this season, you need Game Time. Game Time is the ticket and app that makes it easier than ever to score the best deals on tickets to sports, concerts, and shows, and they guarantee the lowest price. If you haven't given Game Time a shot yet, you don't know what you're missing. You guys are going to love this app. We've had tons of Barstool fans using it, hitting us up on social about all the great deals they're getting. Me and Grinelli have been using it all year. We've got the playoff games, a few concerts over the summer because of the great deals. So download the Game Time app, go to the account tab to create a login, and redeem code CHICKLETS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Download Game Time. Last-minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Uh, what, talking about the uh, Florida Panthers, you're pretty down on their future right now. No first-rounders for the next three years. They've traded away all these assets, but never really got a good playoff run out of it. Uh, they got two second round picks and two third round picks in the next three years. They traded Devin Devon Levi. What's the issue with the, with the Panthers with that you uh, sent the tweet out about him? Fill us in. I think Bill Zito is a moron. Um, That's harsh. I think he's made some moves where you look at the future of this team. Yeah. yeah their team is good. They have a good team. They're not going to win the Stanley cup. Um, here. I wrote some stuff down. You guys ready? I can hop in in the meantime. You guys okay, ready? Go ahead. You're ready. Oh my God. You got a list. Claude Giroux for a first-round pick and Owen Tippett. Giroux doesn't re-sign. Ben Sherratt for a first-round pick and a solid prospect. Sherratt doesn't re-sign. Sam Reinhart for a first-round pick and Devon Levi. 
Levi's the best goalie prospect outside the NHL. Sam Bennett for a second round pick and Emil Heineman, 2020 second round pick and for sure a solid NHL player in the future. And then I think the worst of all is the Kachuk for Huberto McKenzie, a first round pick and the other solid prospect in Cole Schwint. So he's traded away the 2022, 23, 24 and 25 first round picks. They got swept by Tampa last year and he has decided to not add any defenseman after trading away Uyghur. They also, after losing Sherratt, you got no Uyghur, you got no Sherratt, you got smoked in the second round of the playoffs. You have zero cap room and you have no picks to then bring anyone else in at the deadline. Yeah, that's your biggest issue is I I think that he's done a great job of constructing guys up front. Like Kachuk has fit in seamlessly. Kachuk's nasty. He's nasty. It's he's fucking barking up everybody's tree every night. Like as advertised, no, no issue moving over. The thing is, is like, I agree with you. There's like, they're like one or two pieces away and they have nothing in the farm and they have no picks in order to go get something at the deadline. We, we already know how expensive things are. They fucking gave it up for, you saw what they had to give up for, to get Giroux and, and the, maybe the lack of help that that provided. So it's not even guaranteed yet. They can't even do it. I will say though, they, the forward group. And I would say that the guys on the back end who have filled in, in the meantime, Forsling looked really good against uh, Philadelphia. The forwards are, are helping out and alleviate alleviating a lot of the stress on the back end right now. Cause it is very thin, but but they fucking did a good job, and they are doing a good job. That team up front. Well, they're a is, good team. They won the uh, President's Trophy last year. They're a good team. I'm talking about the future of this team. And there isn't, mu- there isn't going to be much of a future in, say, three, four years, five years with zero fucking draft picks. And I don't think in that time, and it's one thing in that time, if you're competing for the Stanley Cup, dude, they are not winning the Stanley Cup. They're not winning the Cup. So do you think do you think you th- you think if he could have a redo he'd want to redo it and keep Huberto keep Uyghur? Uh that okay so that... so that one that one that's got to be I shouldn't your have said worst issue. of all. I shouldn't have worst of all cuz Kachuk is so good and he does change the 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 not the culture but the way the team Dynamic. plays he's such a motherfucker. And and Huberto's different in that in that aspect but I think I think the Giroud deal is a tough one. Because I mean, Tippett's a nice player, dude, and a first rounder. And now Giroux's gone, and you won four playoff games. Eh, I don't know. Yeah, usually if you have you bottoming out this much, you draft picks. You usually had at least a couple of good playoff runs in there at some. Exactly, but, that's what I'm you know, saying. Yeah, you at least don't. you went to the conference finals. You lost in the cup final. You even maybe won a Stanley Cup, and then you don't care. It was all worth it. They got swept in the second round and barely had a chance. So maybe they proved me wrong, but. I got Panthers fans coming at me online. Bill Zito, he's built this team. All right, dude. It looked great last year in the playoffs. Let's see what that happens this year. They had they had to play 5D the other day. They have no money. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, I'll be the guy to switch it to a more positive topic. Uh, we got to interview Kachuk on the pregame, and he had a couple beautiful apples, and I just – Buddy, this is what hockey needs in the States. Guys like this who are going to come on, fucking let it fly. Chirp guy. They, they, he, he's a fucking rock star and he needs to be in an American market. Just totally fucking with Kucherov. I don't know if Kuch hit him first. He, so he so him some he people online too shot. are saying, oh, he costs his team the game. Like, do you think he gives a flying fuck about a game this early in the season against his rival? No, he's planting a mind torpedo saying, I'm going to put your fucking face through the glass twice as hard of this every single fucking round of a playoff or every game of a playoff series. If we meet you guys and he's investing into it now. And that's what I fucking love. I love that clip. And I I don't got nothing against Kucherov, but he spiced up this rivalry tenfold. Absolutely. Well, I do have a couple things you might want to laugh at because college hockey was pretty interested in this weekend, a rare college brawl between Alaska and Omaha. I I put the clip on the outline. It was on, I think we put off this chicklets feed too. 
I guess they uh, were celebrating. One team was celebrating a goal right in front of the other team's bench. And then it had the same thing happen done to them later in the game. And somebody took offense to it. I think they went through the handshake line and a fucking brawl broke out. That's very rare for college, right? Whit? I mean, you don't even see much fighting. Well, handshake line after something like that is a dumb idea, especially if they were riling each other up. Was it in the handshake line, Whit? Did you watch it? I didn't see if it, if it started from there. One of the tweets said, uh, uh, "Why weren't the adults in charge make make sure there was no handshake line after the way this game went?" So it, it sounded like it it might have happened in the handshake line. It was tough to tell based on the video. But either way, a brawl in college it's just not something you see. You might see two guys once in, once in a blue moon, but this was looked like nineteen seventies minor league. Is I went to see uh, ASU the other day with Donor to watch his kid play, and I will say that the fact that the score was getting out of hand and the other team kind of took a few jabs at the goalie like ran into him accidentally on purpose a couple times they should be letting these fucking kids fight fuck some of them are just such rats they need oh college is ridiculous and you got guys running around around. like torpedoes they need a few fucking shots to the jugular to smarten them up shout out don't son i think he scored the first goal in that new arena yeah yeah mullet is it mullet Mullet That's arena. sick. What'd yeah. you think, Biz? What'd you think of the arena? Oh, it's awesome atmosphere. They had the college section, 400 seats. They got the band going. Yeah, that's um, the best. The, the chance, very lively. It was awesome. Good. And we're going to have a box for like 12 games this year, correct? I got 12 box, 12 games this year with a box for the Coyotes. We're going to do a couple of uh, Pink Whitney nights with contests. A couple big deal brewing nights with contests. We'll run through this. A couple nights will be going to charity. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to give some to the alumni because they're so oh, only- sick. Yeah. Like uh, Wayne McBean that t- does such a great job here and Tyson Nash. And there's a bunch of guys who are still around the community and very involved. Shane Doan, a bunch of guys, they got a skate going too. So because they had one in the short amount of boxes, they don't this year. Oh, give it to them. And when the charities come in, there could be a couple guys there from the alumni, bring them in, explain to them a game a little bit if they don't really understand what's going on, but make it a a fun night for everybody. And yeah, it was a nice gesture by the Coyotes and I'm still get to get get to work for the broadcast, do some internet content with them. So we're going to have Pasha vlogging some of my experiences. We're going to go to the opening game on Friday. Winnipeg Jets are doing their, uh, they're coming into town for the first ever game, NHL game out of ASU. And then I'll be working the game on Sunday against the New York Rangers. So the ESPN broadcast has the first game. So it'll be a good time, man. Did you hear this news that come across the wire recently? The league is reportedly looking at Australia for games in 2023 or 2024. And the Bruins might be involved. Is this going to be a chicklets roadie to Aussie? Are we going to Australia? How wild would that be? Oh, I've been there before. I know. Too. Recorded a few. Uh, I think we hired. I think we hired you in Australia. I heard right. it's the best looking people in the world. Disagree. Really? Hard disagree. Yeah. Hard. Hard disagree. Everyone looks like they just look like Americans, but skinnier. There was nothing special. Italy had way better looking people. Way better. What? Way better. Way better. That that flight too. I would say it's that's not what worth I'm afraid it. of too. It's 13 20... hours. It's like I. It's not worth. I thought it, it was at all. 20 hours. Well, it was it was from Boston. It's 20 hours. I had to fly six hours to L.A., uh, layover in L.A., and then fly 13 hours to oh to Australia. God. It was not worth it. Like that's tough. But that's I. That would be hard to do because you look at sometimes the struggles of teams when they come back from the Euro. It's like. You come back from Australia, you you need it. You, you got to give them like two weeks till they have a game, right? Yeah, that's a hike. Yeah, that's a lot different than flying over to Europe, especially if, if the Boston is indeed going to be one of the teams. But that would be cool, though, because that, hockey is growing over there. I remember, Biz, you were over I went there over the there to do thing, something right? with the Olympic network. Yeah, we so got about we the growth of the game. game. We I met a bunch of Chicklets yeah. listeners. Yeah. I met up with a bunch of guys over there, actually. Did you guys see that that guy kid tossed the stick into the uh, crowd kid on uh, Minnesota, Rhett Pitlick? Yeah. He scores a goal, throws a stick in the crowd. It's not an overtime game winner. He, they throw the stick back. He gets a 10 minute misconduct. But that that's worth it just for the fucking story right there. The fucking, he, he saw the, the Jack stick. Hughes and and then it's just, he spent the next 10 minutes in the box. Oh, Are we going to talk about the New Jersey Devils? Oh, shit. Have we, I don't think we've talked about the New Jersey. All right. Devils all right. Give us your devil's take that, that it's not just better goaltending while they're playing well. Well, 
Well, my, my take is that they, listen, I said that they were trash. The team was trash online. I was going a little harsh. That was me fucking around with the people who have been calling for, for the coach's head when they're first, first the and, and all these analytical categories. Now everybody's harping about goaltending. Like the first two games, they ended up losing against Detroit and they lost to Philly. Yeah. Not great starts, but buddy, the first fucking goal in that Philly game was just a basic defensive zone face off. Like, lost coverage. What the fuck is Lindy Ruff supposed to fucking do about a breakdown in defensive zone coverage off a basic one face-off in the offensive zone? And then the next one was a turnover in the neutral zone. The defenseman, no gap, lazy up the ice, and then Konechny gets the fucking turnover, zip, 2 nothing. Before they're finished announcing that third goal, fucking Palat loses guy in the slot point blank in the back of the net. So everybody was like, oh, goaltending this, fire the coach. It's like, well, which one is it? Because now all of a sudden Blackwood over the last couple games is, hey, getting some better fucking D in front of them, less breakdowns. They continue to lead in a lot of these analytical categories, but this has also been a team that's like everybody keeps talking about their analytics year over year over year. Well, it just seems like they buttoned things the fuck up and then they played a couple hard-nosed games. And I think the quotes was, and a G, I might've been talking to you, Matty Barzell. After the game, he's like, holy fuck. He goes, those boys can skate. Well, keep in mind, the Islanders are a little bit slow because that's how Lou kind of builds those teams. But hey, here we go. Now they gotta now they gotta go on a stretch where they got some games that they have to win. And let's see what we got here. I'm just more trying to rile up this very confused fan base. It's to like, oh, it's the goalies issue, the coaches issue, and all of a sudden you keep on to bragging about this team online. Well, let's let, let, let's see where we go from here. Well, they've won three in a row, and then they got they're at home against Washington. Next night they're in Detroit on a back to back, and then they're two nights later, three nights later, they're at home against Colorado. So a little bit different test than them winning three in a row against the Ducks, the Islanders, and the Sharks. I'm not going to shit on them for winning. I'm going to I'm going I'm going to see much like I talked about. Uh, who was it earlier? Their next little stretch of games here who, when they got the the, the, the Kraken, the the Canadians, and Buffalo. another uh, in Chicago. So let's see, let's see what they're made of. But stop fucking calling for Lindy Ruff's head, you fucking idiots. And goaltending's not your issue. If you go back and back and watch those goals, it's fucking guys with their head up their ass in the slot, giving up point blank opportunities because you're not willing the or you're not winning the 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 hard areas of the ice. But cool, man. Keep sending me your fucking spreadsheets. Yeah, they love they love the. Advanced That's all they do. Is send me their spreadsheets. Fans. Before we continue, here's a word from our friends at Shopify. It's time to knock that new business idea out of the park with Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to start, run, and grow your business. Forget the off-season work. Shopify makes it simple to sell to anyone from anywhere. Whether you're selling warm-ups or wall hangers, it's time to start selling with Shopify and join the platform simplifying commerce for millions of businesses worldwide. With Shopify, you'll customize your online store to your brand, discover new customers, and build the relationships that create diehard fans. Shopify fields all the sales channels to grow a winning business from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform, even across social media platforms like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. And thanks to 24-7 support and free on-demand business courses, Shopify is on your team every step of the way. When you're ready to take your winning idea to the world, team up with Shopify, the commerce platform powering millions of businesses down the street and around the globe. Try out Shopify for free today and start selling anywhere. Sign up for a free trial at shopify.com slash chicklets, all lowercase. Once again, go to shopify.com slash chicklets to start selling online today. Shopify.com slash chicklets. Uh, a couple of milestones we want to note. Uh, congrats to Milan Lucic on playing in his, in his 1100th NHL game. Seemed like only yesterday he put that guy through the glass over the garden. Mike Van uh, Ryan. Nashville's uh, David Poyle became the first NHL GM to reach 3,000 games Saturday versus Philly. Seven more wins, and he'll be the first GM to reach 1,500 wins. And Lou Lamorello became the first man in NHL history to manage a club into his 80s when he turned 80 on Friday. And I want to wish a very special happy 78th birthday to my dad, Leo, who I know is listening and watching when this popped up. Dad, happy birthday, buddy. I love you, and hopefully we get a lot more out of you. Yeah, you're the best. Happy oh. birthday, Mr. R.A. Happy birthday. <laughs> nah, he's the man. I got to give him a shout-out. Uh, wait, you mentioned the uh, pa- Patriots earlier. How about this stooge, Ben Volan, at the Boston Globe? 
absolute. Oh pitching. my God. Crazy story. And for anyone who really doesn't follow Barstool or didn't, didn't see this. So Ben Volan, um, I think he's like the, the NFL columnist for the Boston Globe and a complete Patriots hater just have, have, has always had it out for the team. So fans already couldn't stand him. He, <laughs> I believe he went on WEI, a local sports station, and he talked about, was it an attitude problem that he mentioned Mac had? Yes. He needed to be humbled. He needed to be humbled. And, or, or he went on a show in which he said, like, the worst thing that could have happened to this guy. That's what happened. He went on another show. He went on, like, a TV show on uh, Comcast Sports Center or something, saying, I think the worst thing that happened was this guy getting in the pro ball, a little too cocky, a little big for his britches, needed to be humble. And after that, some barstool stoolie, sent him a DM saying, I think he worked in the ticket office and that there's this big thing out that Max Camp um, did not want the, the zappy kid starting and basically made up all this ridiculous shit to which this reporter didn't even do an ounce of research, didn't do any investigative journalism, didn't do anything to make sure that this was true and just went on WEI, the sports station, and said, I got a source that's in the know. I got a source that knows that said there's a big time attitude problem with Mac Jones. And funny enough, Feidelberg of all people gets this kid reaching out to me. He's like, dude, I sent this asshole this DM and he just ran with it. Oh my God. <laughs> so it's just what's amazing though is I don't even think the guy got suspended or in, like, how oh. do you just make something up like that? Report it as fact. Use it as a source that is in the know and that would know this to be a fact and get no sort of repercussion for, for doing for doing that. I, I guess the answer for that, if I'm the Globe, because he did, even though he's re representing the Globe, it wasn't his Globe work. He was on a TV show, which he's allowed to be on. So the Globe's probably not going to even pee pee whack him because it didn't happen while he was under the employ employee of the Globe. But you know, you know what? what? Can you, you think imagine? it was the same guy who told me Huberto was captain? <laughs> <laughs> Or that told you Goudreau was fat and out of shape heading into camp. Hey, it, hey. Co it could have been that guy too. Imagine how many times, burners. imagine how many times that Volan has made shit up though. Oh, like dude. there's just no chance. That's the first time he's done that. And it's hilarious to me. Like Bill Belichick, probably the most brilliant football mind of all time. And I mean, that's coach. You have a, his record speaks for itself. Like he has to sit there and take questions from a bunch of English majors to act like they know more about football than him. And it's like, that must be so infuriating and, and Volan. Yeah. They call him trolling Volan. He, he, he doesn't, he, Jerry Thornton knows 10 times more, a hundred times more football than this guy, but trolling Volan, man, it's just pissed off a lot of people, but uh, keep it with the sports theme there. You know, Sunday was the 28th ever sports equinox in which MLB, NHL, NBA, and MLB all had games. It doesn't happen too often. I know, I know. But, like, I actually saw a bunch of people kind of tweeting about it. And to me, the 28th time, it's like, eh. I also yeah, I think I also think it's been happening every year the last couple. It, of, it's just like it's, I, it's probably twenty eight years now. in a row. It, no, no, it's probably <laughs> honestly they, they have mo mostly been recent because you know what happened. Baseball used to be over by the time yeah, the NBA. That's why started. it's not that fascinating because so, it's I, like it's going to keep happening year over hey, year. Hey, hey, in twenty eight more years, we're like <laughs> this is the fifty sixth time. Yeah, in a row that the sports equinox has happened. Yeah. What was amazing to me on the sports scene is. The once proud New York Yankee franchise are the biggest bunch of losers. And the amazing thing is, Biz, I don't know if you saw this. So they went down 3-0 to the Houston Astros and the ALCS. The fucking manager of the Yankees, Aaron Boone, decided to show the guys clips to fire them up of the Red Sox being down 0-3 and coming back in 2004 and winning the pennant against the Yankees. I, I remember that series. I don't know so, much about baseball, but I remember where I was when they came back from 03 to beat the Yankees. And what the fuck is that? This guy's showing clips of the Yankees blowing the lead, a 3 0 lead. Like, to try, like what the hell? Yeah, that's uh, made George no sense Steinbrenner is, is somewhere. I don't know where you go when you die. And, but he and they're is not going to make any changes, somebody said. They're going to keep everything. But ju is Judge coming back? I don't know. Don't know. I don't know. He turned down seven Free years, two hundred and twenty million or whatever. I mean, what's he going to get now? He just he'll, broke the he'll whole get 35 run. a year. He'll get at least thirty five a year. And he turned down thirty a year, basically already. Who who who's he fucking? He's got to be pounding some. Hot oh, he's got to be crushing somebody hot. So what? How he's about a, he's a he's a he's like a Greek god, isn't he? How big is he? 
I, he, he's six ten and his hammer's about a foot long. I'm sure. <laughs> oh, is it is it poking out like John? He Hamm's hit his thirty eighth home run with his hog. Actually, I don't know if oh, you knew shit. that. So it was only sixty one oh, with a bat. Holy shit, that guy's yeah, special. Sixty two, including him, his hog. Give, a, give him the bag. How about Tico Hazard's Texas? Buy him out. Tico Texas fucking with all the Yankee fans at, at Boston. I'll see tell you that? though, if hey, I, hey, listen, so this is barstool sports chatter for all you spit and chickles fan. This Tico, imagine having to watch a game next oh. to her. And 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 her team winning and her just oh, owning you, that's tough. With that belly dude, button right in your face. I will say, oh. dude, she's got some fucking balls to go to Yankee Stadium like and and be like that. Cause I when I went to the, the uh, yeah, series we just talked about, 2004, I went to game seven. My buddy from New York's like, don't wear anything, Red Sox, keep your head up, blah, blah, blah. So to go in there during the playoffs and have, even though she's a girl, it's still New York City. There's a lot of fucking She don't give a there. shit. She doesn't give a shit. Nobody fucked with her, man. She she got it done. And also, dude, how fucking good is Bryce Hopper? We got to give him. Fun. He's amazing. Yeah. Did you see the quote He's of the incredible. owner on the field? Uh, on the field, the owner went up to him and, and they were having a conversation. I believe a reporter asked him, what'd you say? And he, and, and he said to Bryce Harper, he said, uh, you're, you're, you're actually underpaid. You're so good. You're underpaid. I don't know how you can make $300 million and be underpaid, but you are, you're that good. So uh, Bryce Harper, big fan of that guy. And what's cool is um he left the Washington nationals and they ended yeah. up winning a world series. So it's really kind of his time. I hate the Astros. I can't stand that team. I've never liked that team. Even before I knew they cheated, uh, something about them drives me nuts. But I'm really rooting for the Phillies. I feel like Bryce Harper is a good guy. He's playing out of this world right now. And when he hit that home run in the eighth inning um, to take the lead 4-3, he, he got to the bench and he I think that they they had his, you could read his lips say, I can't believe I just did that. Or like, oh, I can't believe. He goes, I holy shit, I just did that. Holy shit, I just did that. And um, one of those, for baseball fans out there, there's one out. Um, the Padres have a guy on first and second. I don't know the guy's name. I guess he's been struggling all playoff. He's a lefty. He's up to bat. He fucking bunted. He bunted and moved the guys over to second and third, which does absolutely nothing with two outs. Maybe if there's no outs, you do it, and then you get the guy on third. You could score on a sack fly, but like one of the most mind-numbing decisions I've ever seen in playoff baseball. By the player just, or the manager told them? No, the player did it on his own, dude. Player did it on his own, trying to he kind of tried to drag punt it as a lefty down the first base side to get a hit. But it ended up being a throw it down to first, get him out, let the runners advance. Next guy, first pitch, flew out to right field. And that was it. The Phillies win the pennant. So go Phils uh, in the World Series. Oh, and, and wow. That deep in the game. Jesus. Dude, it was the ninth inning. <laughs> first and second with one yeah. out. And he spunts the two guys that's over like, and yeah, went nowhere else. Yeah, that's like the situational Dude. awareness that I had out there in the National League. Oh, my Philly, God. That is. Whew. Philly was absolute banana lands after the city of Philly. Absolutely going crazy. I can't imagine what they're going to do if they win the World Series because the, they were acting like it last night. It looked like a lot of fun to be there, though. The, uh, their crowd, just the, the way they cheer, it's so violent. They just, like, throw beer oh. all over each other. And is that how it is at every stadium? I just feel like when no. you see the home run clips from there, you're like, oh, my goodness. No, this, no that, place, that place is at another level right pit. now. It's a mosh pit. All right, boys, uh, what, time to wrap it up. Um, yeah, one more course. thing, guys, before we wrap up. Um, I should have mentioned this a few weeks ago. It's really, really sad news in the hockey world. Um, a kid I was friendly with and and a kid a lot of people knew and really respected and really liked, Josh Sioko. Uh, he passed away. Uh, he was a assistant coach at Merrimack. He played at UNH. He actually lived with with my buddy Brian Foley for a little bit after college and just a just an awful loss for the hockey world because he was a he was a great kid and so he's going to be really missed and I wanted to bring his name up. Um, so feel so sorry for his friends and family, but we we needed to bring him up. So rest in peace, Josh. And it's a tough way to end the show, but we appreciate you guys listening. We had to shout out somebody um, who deserved to have his name mentioned. So well said, Wit. Talk to you guys soon, and I uh, love you all, and have a great week. Peace.